Greetings, everyone. <laughs> and welcome to a very special, not four hour episode <laughs> of Monster Party. Monster Party! Monster Party! Monster! It's big, it's huge! It is huge. But it's not four hours. It's not four hours, no. No, no. no, no. but it's gonna be, it's gonna, we have a lot of things. Yes. It's yes. chock full of stuff. It's chock full of excitement. And speaking of which. Yes, yeah, speaking of excitement, who are you, sir? <laughs> I'm Matt Weinhold. I'm Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Stroth. And I'm James Gonis. You're excited. I am. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always excited, Larry. Look really? It, can... Really? Are you really? I really am. Every show. It may not show, but I am. It's electric. You can see it in his eyes. I know, it really is. He, you're like the human version of like a 4th of July fountain. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before. You know, oh, you've heard all the lines. <laughs> but we have a great episode. It's a massive topic. It's yeah, huge. Yeah. It really is a massive topic. We're probably going to scratch the surface. And it's, yeah, it's going to be one of those It'll be topics. be like, like an itchy wound. Yeah, yeah. It's healing. Yeah, all we're going to do is You're annoy scabby. you. You can scab you yeah. never quite heals. Yeah, it's, it's a crust of a topic. Matt, what is our crusty topic? The topic is... Horror documentaries. Horror documentaries. Oh, <laughs> uh, Huge list. Yeah, and there's no way. There's no way that we could cover all the horror documentaries, especially if you included things that are, you know, bonus material on right, DVDs. Like extras, or, features, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's just no way. Right. But at least we can point out, kind of like we did with anime. Yeah. We right. can, you know... Talk about some of our favorites. Talk about our favorites. Talk yeah. about, you know, what we consider the important ones. And get an inside look at how a great horror documentary comes together. Yeah. Mm. And that leads us in to our very, very special guest. Well, you know, great documentaries can only be made by great filmmakers. That's true. And we have one here. Yes, we do. Not only is he a great <laughs> filmmaker... But he is Monster Party family. Oh, yeah. I, I consider him Monster Party family. Yeah, he's like fifth, you do? fifth, you? Me fifth member. Yeah, 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 no. I mean, we love this guy. We do. He is the former editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. He's the man behind It Came From Blog. It Came From Blog. That's correct. And... He is the director of In Search of Darkness. In Search of Darkness. A four hour documentary on 80s horror films. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome back David Weiner. David Weiner! I kind of do feel like the fifth Beatle of Monster Party. <laughs> and, and, you're and, more and it's an absolute honor. Yeah, you're more Stu Sutcliffe than <laughs> Pete Best. Yeah, no, you're but, the talented one. But look, I I, I want to get right into this because you're- We only have you for so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this, doc, this podcast is not going to be as long as your documentary. Nothing is as long as my documentary. <laughs> Although we've we've come close. Yeah, that's true. But your, your documentary is chock full of stuff. The full title is In Search of Darkness, a journey into iconic 80s horror. That's right? correct, yes. And it really is. And it's a massive journey. Kind of like a year by year look. Yes. At, at horror in the 80s. And right? you really do yep, a great yep. job in covering a lot of material. And everybody but Larry from Monster Party went to the premiere. But uh, Larry's been catching up. Larry was yeah, invited, yeah. but Larry was unable to make it. He couldn't do it. Sometimes, you know, life gets in the way. That's right. Yeah. But we sat there in those seats. For four hours. And I'm telling you, at hour two, we were kind of like, hey, this thing is just breezing right along. Yeah. And that yeah. is a testament to your talent. Yeah, well, thank totally. you. How thank did you. this thing come together? Well, this came together when I was taking a walk in the park, literally. Wow. <laughs> and I got an email or a text or a alert on my phone, however you get these things these days. I don't even know which uh, <laughs> format I got it. But I looked at my phone and a friend of mine, Jessica Dwyer, who uh, is a horror journalist and who I had hired to uh, write some cool stuff for Famous Monsters. We had met on the, the set of The Conjuring 2. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and she's, she's horror community. She's horror folk. She's smart. She's talented. Anyway, we would kept in touch, and she's like, hey, David, I am part of this project that is super-duper cool, and you need to be involved in some way, shape, or form. You need to get in touch with executive producer Robin Block, who's putting this thing together. 
And I said, mm, I looked at the poster. I looked at the description, which was already done. <laughs> and I looked at the trailer, which they had already cut, which was a, an amazing collective of probably close to 200 films from the 80s, uh, 80s horror movies. And uh, I got in touch with Robin Block, and I said, tell me the story, tell me the story. And uh, I will cut to the chase. And ultimately, I came on as an advisor. And this was this was Robin Block's idea. And was, that, this is a crowdfunded thing? Yeah, you, this, right? is a, this is a crowdfunded thing. It was, it was a couple weeks before the Kickstarter was kicking off. Uh, Robin Block had this idea that he basically just wanted to do a nostalgia trip through the 80s and through 80s horror movies. Uh, he was also working on another project that's that's coming out very shortly called In Search of the Last Action Heroes, which Ooh, is an 80s-centric cool. action heroes. <laughs> nice. Schwar- nice. Schwarzenegger, Van Damme, Bronson. Chuck Norris, Bronson, wow. anyone and everyone. Four hours and, again? Uh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Unique in that uh, mine mine is a tad longer. It uh, had to be. No, no, that's a regular-sized documentary that's, that's uh, directed by Oliver Harper, who's a U.K., personality and uh anyway so this uh this was handed to me on a silver platter do you want to write and direct this and uh <laughs> wow cool. uh, I, I, I obviously yes, so, i obviously skipped a couple uh parts of that but ultimately <laughs> it was i mean no one no one yeah had. we don't need to know what you were wearing or you know <laughs> or what i did or how guilty i feel afterwards but uh <laughs> no li- listen listen this is the, a once in a lifetime opportunity and uh i i i cannot believe it came my way and I was given a, a wonderful platform to make a, an insane movie and the encouragement to do it. And guess what? I delivered a movie that was like four hours and almost four and a half hours long. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. From the get go, did you know that it was going to be four hours? Absolutely not. It was meant to be 90 minutes to two hours. And if we met our first stretch goal, we would make a three hour director's cut in addition. But I created a. Uh, Robin wanted to do uh, a year by year format where you go from 1980 to 1989 and you just cover That's all really the great cool. That's a great movies. format. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to expand that where so it didn't feel repetitive or if you didn't, if there were, there are clearly things that are going to be left out. Sure. Of course. And so yeah. because of that, I wanted to be able to expand uh, sort of interstitial chapters where you can cover other various topics. And it also gives you a great opportunity to touch on other movies if you're not going to focus on them very specifically right. and so in between 1983 and 1984 you could talk about the holiday slasher subgenre mm, you could talk right. about 3d the very brief and bright <laughs> and flame out of the, of the 3d resurgence or you could talk about you know final girl and the controversial yes. you know moniker right. that not everyone necessarily embraces or right. you could talk yeah. about fandom you could talk about talk about uh, music uh, sound and music, music yeah. and right. sound design right. anyway so that was my opportunity to basically create a movie that, to me, made sense. And of course, as I was doing this, and as we were doing uh, interviews with upwards of 50 people, I realized it just was going to get longer and longer and longer and longer. And we kind of grappled with how long can this be, or how long should this be, uh, or how long will it be? And there, there were elements that we had to take into account, like how much can you fit on a Blu-ray? You know, yeah, right. Yeah. What, you know, if, right, if, you, yeah. if you cut it in half and put it on two Blu-rays, mm-hmm. what are the costs incurred mm-hmm. to manufacture that? It mm-hmm. might be cost prohibitive. Mm-hmm. Imagine so. if this thing were on Laserdisc. <laughs> <laughs> how many how many times you'd have to flip? You know? right, right. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, only at the premiere. And uh, it's actually playing at Monster Fest in Melbourne on the 13th. Uh, So this will have come and gone by the time this podcast comes out. But if you are watching it on the big screen, there's an intermission because it's just too long. So after two hours, I put in an intermission. And after the intermission sign goes for about 20 seconds, you get that, that vintage laser disc Flip me over turtle image. <laughs> oh, that's great. And uh, I thought that was pretty fun. That's, that's great. Awesome. And, that's great. And I, I have a feeling there's some people actually thought that this movie was on Laserdisc. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Now you did get some amazing interview subjects. Yeah. I mean, I can't. Even, I don't even know where to start. There's Joe Dante. Mm-hmm. There's Joe Bob Briggs, who's mm-hmm. hysterical. Oh, right. he's great. Carpenter. John Carpenter. John Carpenter. There's all of these Atkins. Act- Tom Scott, Atkins, yeah, yeah, yeah. Heather Langenkamp, Barbara, Barbara Crampton, Crampton. <laughs> right? Oh. Tom Atkins, I want to hang with him. Like, oh, that yeah, guy is so fun. Keith David, mm-hmm. yeah. He he brought this wonderful like 
intellectual feel to that velvety his... voice. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was that's so all great. you need. He could have read, you know, like, a, like a page from, uh, you know, a recipe. And but everything yeah. he had to offer, it, it felt like just just laden with wisdom. But you oh, yeah. also Mick Garris, you Mick Garris, his, sure, yeah. Uh, you had Jeffrey Combs. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, yeah. the list just goes a on former and, uh, uh, former guest. Yes, well, well, there was a lot of Marsh Party guests yeah. featured that's right. actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like like you said about the nostalgia because. Sometimes, you know, documentaries on, on a particular cinema genre can be a little dry, a little bit too yeah. academic. Yeah. And like what I like about this is, first of all, the year by year approach mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and people recollecting on particular movies of whatever year. But and then, like you say, you do little segments on the fandom or the music or whatever. But it's just not this kind of like, you know, dry. Kind I, of did, like, I didn't want this to be didactic. I didn't want yeah, it to be condescending. I know I know that there's a lot of material in there that if you're a, a true horror fan through and through, you you know a good portion of this stuff. Right. So the idea was to surprise the hardcore horror fans with a couple new angles and takes on things, uh, but also to sort of educate and inform people who aren't as familiar, but they just love a couple films. But I think right. what was different... Uh, and definitely very much my approach for this movie was to have all these people that you mentioned, all these amazing uh, icons of of 80s horror, uh, incredibly creative and talented people, talking about their favorite movies, talking about yeah, what right, they love, right. talking what about like. what, it, That's it what inspires I, them, yeah. and, and, and having the whole thing feel like you're having a conversation at a <clears throat> table or a bar with these guys and right. these girls. And, yeah. and <clears throat> That's what I really loved about the documentary is that it brought you in through a very personal portal. Mm. It did really feel like just a bunch of friends talking about the stuff that they love, even though a lot of these people were actually in these movies Mm -hmm. or, or directed them or, but it had a real, yeah, a real personal feel to it that, took away all of the dryness that you are in danger of getting when people get too into the weeds when they start talking about the thing that they love. Yeah, right. you know, I think one of the, one of the tricks that, that we used was we didn't want to linger too long yeah. on anybody. Right, right. There's so much ground to cover, and you can never cover all of it. But the idea was, uh, I, I think that was one of the big challenges for me, is because there were so many amazing stories told. Yeah. There, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I was privy to some long amazing stories that, that I would do no justice if I cut them down. Right. Sometimes I used a sliver of them, but there's right. a lot of them sitting there like in the quote-unquote vault. Well, that's what I wanted to ask <laughs> because this thing is chock full of such great stories. And, and okay, so this film is four hours long, but is there like going to be extra special footage or something that that's going to be you know on the on the blu-ray or, or i mean is there another couple hours worth how of stuff? how long could this be <laughs> yeah, you could easily do really another yeah you could easily do another 4 hours to be honest i, yeah. well, I bet there's another right? there, there's t- definitely enough yeah. to make mm-hmm. more and there's the plan to make more extended different variants different versions collectors editions and so on, and, uh, and Ooh, like I, want the the I want the collectors. Well, 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 well the thing is, this is something where <laughs> don't it, open it. it is, oh, I'll have to get two. I'll have to get two. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> They're going to be shrink wrapped just for you, Larry. Oh, <laughs> see, he loves you. Yeah, he does. I, and why well, put a disc in there? It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, no, you, ha- no you have to put. You, you have, have to, to have put the disc. You can tell by the weight. The weight. Yes, he'll know. He'll X-ray it. You can shake it. Sometimes you can shake it, and the DVD might come loose. The way you want that. That. No, but then I'll know yeah. it's in there. Yeah, well, yeah, but it's yeah. it's a double edged yeah, sword. But then there. you can't yeah. sell it, can you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, for, well, for that's it. not the idea. I don't want to sell it. I want to Do, keep it. Don't you? No. <clears throat> no. Eventually. Okay. No. What if what? he signed it? Well then, <laughs> oh, well, then he definitely wants to sell. Wait, it. wait, wait! No, no, no! Because okay, someone down the street. Here's a problem. If okay. you give me a sealed, DV- I'm sorry, James, really quickly. If you have a sealed. <laughs> Blu-ray, and you get to be, oh, Larry, it's signed. That means you sign the 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 shrink wrap. Now, if it gets right, open, true, then, true. then the shrink wrap shrivels up, and then it's you. Then, it's, then that autograph is like gone. You know what? The shrink wrap true. is necessary when you want to use it as a coaster because you could just totally, you know, that's true. Water, no, water, you got to open it and what, then take see, the like. I have paper I, I have some documentaries here in front of us, and it's like like this one here that's autographed by Ray Harryhausen. Oh, not not, not sure. familiar. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> this was shrink wrap, but you had to open it so yeah. you could take the little sleeve out so right. he could oh, sign we, it. We'll right. say that for a shrink wrap episode. <laughs> I'm sorry. James. Anyway, so, so the James. I, we digress. So the idea is that this is kind of a living, breathing entity that, that can definitely... <laughs> 
it could change and it could expand and, and it could all sorts of things can happen to it. And that's what's nice about the structure that I created is that you can insert stuff easily. Um, Waiting for the joke. But, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. But, 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 I've yeah. gone there too many times. <laughs> but I do have a question about, it's not really a question, but a comment, really a compliment about the format mm. and what you do where, you know, not to give too much away, but when you're introducing a new film, you see a bunch of like, it's like uh, a mosaic of mosaic, posters. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, mosaic so of cool. posters. And you can have zoom in on one. And you yeah. look like you could be going to one film. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're teasing yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. But then Which it one? lands on another film. Yeah. Because you're all, hey, oh, 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 wait, 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 wait,
horror movies are overlooked by, say, the Academy, because there are so many great, yep. well acted, beautifully shot horror Tony films. Tony Collette, are you listening? That's yes, right. <laughs> but, but hey, absolutely. But guys, I will say, you know, The Shape of Water did win the Academy Award for Best now, Picture. So yes, it's, it's and a that's, monster. And I, yeah. Horror, yeah, and I, I mean, did it's enjoy. Not, it. Like it's not a slasher, but horror it's not film, but it's, really a horror movie. It's more of a fantasy. I, I give I give that to Larry though. A in, fable. That, in that in this, I think it was pretty remarkable. It was. It's kind of been, and I'm sure I'm missing something in between, but it's really kind of been since Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. That, that, was, a, uh, that a genre film really kind of swept the awards and got all right. the accolades. It rightly deserves. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, it's a little more fantasy than horror. And, uh, well, and you could argue that Silence of the Lambs and, was horror. And yeah. Get Out kind of. That... Well, we just started the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I've just had it. I can't. I can't stand it because you've changed. You've changed since you made this documentary. Us, yes. us, we you're, have changed. Yes. You're all, yeah. us, oh. <laughs> but you know, with Get Out, you've got this movie that did garner all this praise, <clears throat> right? And it's a movie that is, you know, you could see its roots in other horror movies. Oh, sure. But yeah. it was done in a very uh, interesting, new, racial, social commentary kind of way. And as much as I like that movie, and I really do love that yeah. movie, mm-hmm. but I could think of nine more right off the top of my head that are as good, maybe even better in some ways, that also deserve a look and right. that same respect that have great screenplays, wonderful performances, as you say, Tony mm-hmm, Collette. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's just a shame that we have to keep doing this dance all the time yeah. to try to prove that this is a valuable You know what? Genre. Why, why do we have to dance for this particular organization? We feel sometimes that we, I think we need to, yeah. that we have right, to prove right. something. And I think what's happening now, especially right now, that in 2019, in 2019, I think we are really at a place where there's a massive audience for horror and far less people look down on it in the same way that they used to. And, well, Certainly and, not and, in the way they did in the 80s. And that's, and that's ultimately my point. My point is uh, an award is an award. But the reward is having the community embrace right. whatever you do, whether right. it's highbrow, lowbrow, whatever whatever you type of movie that you have made. If it's in the horror genre, the horror fandom will really rally around their favorites, and right. they will defend them to the end. And right. there's something that's really uniquely critic-proof about... 80s horror movies and horror movies in general, where unlike other genres, people are not going to, they're, they're not going to nitpick. Or if they do, people aren't going to care. And, and, right. and, and the horror right. fan is the first to say, listen, I know it's cheesy, but I love it for X, Y, or Z. And yeah. usually it's because it meant something very much deep to them in their own personal experiences. And sure. also that, you know, by watching that documentary too, you could tell that like the 80s really was a, Super creative time for horror films, mm-hmm. even though at that time, like you said, like the horror genre wasn't looked upon that favorably. But I mean, you went from slasher to body horror to all these other permutations of creativity with mm-hmm. with the genre, and maybe even at the time, people weren't as aware of how how rich that period was. I mean, one of my favorite lines in the documentary is uh, by Joe Bob Briggs mm-hmm. when he's talking about he would say, he said like back in the eighties, horror filmmakers were sitting around going. What can we make? And now horror filmmakers sit around going, "What can we remake?" Right? right. Yes. Yeah. And it is yeah. amazing. Like the, the, so many of the horror films from the '80s that were kind of looked down upon are now being remade as like slick, big budget movies. I mean, it's just and and, and not, ruined and not very yeah. memorably. They kind of no. just yeah, come and they go. just come and go. And like the fact that yeah, these movies 30, 40 years old that are still looked well, at as and, fresh. And you look at you look at anything from you know Cronenberg with Videodrome. You got uh, yeah, even even the the Shining, Maniac. Oh yeah, all, all these movies when they they came out were not as well received. No, no. I, 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 arguably Videodrome was probably the most well received. Maniac was a midnight movie, oh. and The Shining was a disappointment to, yeah. to most, if not all, at the time, which is hard to believe. I know. You know, might as well lump, you know, John Carpenter's The Thing in there as well. Yeah, sure. which oh, wasn't oh, hit oh, at oh, the I, time. I, I, right. uh, David, I, re- you know, I remember going. I remember going to that opening weekend, yes. and I was so excited. And I remember going to the theater, and I was shocked. There were not a lot of people in the mm-hmm, theater. Mm-hmm. And I saw the film, and my mind was just blown. And I remember looking around at the end of the movie, going. Why? Why don't more people know about this? How come? <laughs> and I, I had made an argument once before. 
you know, the poster doesn't tell you a lot. Mm-hmm. Also, the ad campaign or the trailer doesn't tell you a lot. Right. And I understand that was by design, but I don't think it worked. Hmm. Because, uh, and I remember the film cost at the time, I think it was like $15 million, and it only made $1 million its opening weekend. And it was considered, oh, well, this yeah. is a they're, loser. They're, well, now think, think of the movies that we loved 30 years ago. We just talked about this. They're remaking them. They remade... Pet Ch- Cemetery. They remade Child's Play. Child's Play. Play. They the remade Poltergeist. Like, like they remade the well, thing. Well, they did a prequel. And, 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 and well, well, now so, listen, yeah, listen to how you're responding, okay? Now think about the people who saw Howard Hawks, the thing from another world. Yes. Here comes the guy who just did The Fog and Halloween yeah. thinking that he can remake Howard Hawks, the thing. Mm-hmm. And it's this, True. It is, it's this big, messy buffet of special <laughs> effects and gross gore slime it's 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 just not what they want they and, want something right. highbrow they want something classy and this is the words of John Carpenter they want something classy and that's not what they got so i think a lot of the box office was relevant to the fact that you had people who were our age at the time that this came out in 82 mm-hmm. stumming their nose at this mm-hmm. and that, and and that's something which is unique in that this particular documentary allows the people who were there when it happened, yeah. even if it didn't happen for them, they still made something, but it, it might not have been a hit. And, but, it, and, 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 but we can now... Yeah, we memorable. Can, it's still memorable. It, to the, you know, it was still a good movie. You know it I mean? was a good movie, but we can now look back in, in, in retrospect and see, listen, it, it might not have done well, but it is it has evolved into just an out-and-out classic. Totally. And why, and why, I remember. And why is that? The, the, and, the Shining. The oh, Shining. Now... Yeah. I don't remember that being a flop. No, yeah. but it I wasn't think it did okay. Hit, it didn't do as well as they thought it was gonna do. Right, and they, I know that uh, there was the backlash because it wasn't like the Stephen book. King. Right. Well, and, and that, Stephen that, and King that was, had a, that was a huge backlash, and I think it's more less about the box office and more about how radically different it was. It was hugely divergent from the King book. King disavowed it. And Kubrick kind of wrote what he wanted to do. Now, we all, you know, that's one of my all-time favorites of any film, of any any genre. Me too. But I I was oblivious because I was young. I was 12 years old when that came out. I I had to sneak into the thing. (laughs) Well, it also wasn't the kind of horror film. uh, To The The Shining. (laughs) It also wasn't the kind of horror film that was being made back in the 80s. It wasn't being marketed. I mean, it was was an anomaly. It was very different from anything. And it was two and a half hours long. You know, it was just like, "Eh." And the thing, the thing came out right around the time that Poltergeist, E.T., right. all these other, Blade Runner, all these other big summer uh, pictures from 1982 came out. Almost, almost didn't stand a chance. Yeah. Well, no, I saw those too. But so, I so did I, but, well, but yeah, not, a lot of, not a lot of people who went to see E.T. Mm-hmm. went to see the thing. You know why? Right. They wanted to see a, a friendly little alien, yeah. like an E.T. Yeah. They didn't want to see a scary, but, grotesque alien. But when it comes to The Shining, if you're a fan of a director, you know, it says a Stanley Kubrick film, and when you go to The Shining, you get Stanley Kubrick, mm-hmm. and you get sure. him at his finest. And I read The Shining, and I loved it. And it was, I think that and Salem's Lot were like the first two books that I read, mm-hmm. novels of Stephen King. Yeah. And I loved him. And I went to see The Shining, and it was very different. Mm-hmm. But I was so amazed by the filmmaking that right. I kind of got over that. And it was it was different, and and even the characterizations were different. Mm-hmm. But it created its own world, and that's what Kubrick does. Right, and that's how that film really works. And it was, and it's just amazing to me that even horror fans couldn't go in there and see the art beyond this radically different version of what they loved. I think I think a, a, a big tie-in factor of that is the whole Stephen King element, and we saw sort of the rise. The peak and then the fall of Stephen King in '80s films. That's now, true. Uh, you know, yes. Stephen King is back in a big way on the big screen now, but it took a while. Everyone t- needed to kind of take a break for him to be back in vogue. Right. That's and, true. Yeah. And and in making this film, I really, even though I knew that there were many, I came to realize how how pervasive Stephen King was in the mm-hmm. '80s, especially with him directing his own movie, yeah. right. Maximum Overdrive, <laughs> which he never did again. Shot deal. That's right. I'm gonna scare the hell out of you. <laughs> 
I thought, you know, uh, that was no, the scariest no, no, part. That was one of my happiest finds was finding that uh, teaser trailer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I always I remember Stephen that. King looking at the camera saying, yeah, actually, I got to yeah. do it myself. Seeing yeah. the best moments of Silver Bullet distilled into like a minute and a uh, half. Excuse me, best moments? <laughs> <laughs> Better moments? It made okay. me actually want to see it again. Really? Is, I'm not going to, but it, but it, <laughs> it it had a moment there. And um, that's one of the things that really, and I, I got to tell you, this, this was... A, a treat. This experience was a real treat for me yeah. in a sense that I'm, I'm not saying that lightly. It's like all of these titles, all of these posters, you know, came down. It's like, oh, my God. Yeah. This was a time when we were all of the age when we were going to the movies by ourselves. And this stuff was really sticking in us. You know, what I mean? like yeah. it just had yeah. that, that imp- so much an impression at that we were at that age. You yeah. Know? Right. And. I, I was surprised at how many of these titles I'd actually seen in theaters. Hmm. <laughs> and w- what I came away with more than anything else was that from all the interviews you, you got, and what was each film? Maybe three minutes? Like, uh, Well, they all ranged in, in, yeah. in length. Some were yeah, a minute. Five some minutes, were, yeah. They averaged about two minutes, two, but three minutes only. It distilled kind of the main takeaway from almost all of these titles, maybe all the titles, like... You know, let's say The Shining. Well, it was not that well received when it came out, but it's look look at it now. Um, Maximum Overdrive, (laughs) made by cocaine. Right, (laughs) right, right. The the thing, the thing where you know it's it's just about the real human reaction to to what this crazy shit that's going on, Mm -hmm. and that's the scene that you share. You know, and and this is perfect. Yeah. Also, it was like it was a time before social media, before everything was examined and analyzed to death, even before a movie came out. Right. It was like. These filmmakers just going out and making their movies, and they would release them, like and like we would discover them. Like it's that kind of almost doesn't exist anymore. Now, now months and months before a movie is even finished, you hear about it and you start hearing. It's that, so it was different. Very, it was very important for me to talk about the video store experience. Oh, absolutely, and, and the, the, that sort of revolution of where all of a sudden all the movies that that we wanted to see. You could sometimes just wait for them to come right into your home. You didn't, and if you were too young and you couldn't get into a rated R movie or sneak in in some way, shape, or form, or you know, do, do an exchange by right. sure. by right. you know buying a bum a bottle of rum, you right? Know? Right. So, so but yeah, that's true. That how you did escort it? you in? <laughs> no, I, this I, is my say, son. Hearsay. You know, but you're right. But, you know, it's funny though because. My understanding was at the video rental store, you weren't supposed to rent a rated R movie to kids like under no, but age 17. But, 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 but you know what? Right ones. They yeah, didn't, yeah. They didn't, yeah. Know. They didn't yeah. care. Yeah, yeah. They didn't care. It's like if you put, I was like, oh, I want to, I want to see The Shining here. <laughs> All right, if you talk like that, you know, well, well, no, no, it's like, <laughs> all right, two bucks, you know, whatever, and then you walk out with this right, movie. Yeah, they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't yeah. care. Well, and that uh, was the Shining and Inside Misty Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that made that made a huge difference in the way everybody consumed this stuff. And I think yeah. it's now a way of consuming things that is essentially gone. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. Jeffrey Combs, our friend Jeffrey Combs, says sure. it's all in former the guest. You can't hold it tangibly in your hands. Nobody cares anymore. I mean, obviously yeah. we've, we're collectors, but there's a whole. There's a whole generation that don't all they know is they just don't concept. know how to browse on, you know, a screen. Yeah. Uh, but and, if you and, have a generation that likes vinyl, because vinyl has kind of come back oh, a yeah. little bit. Big time. And so wouldn't you think that things like VHS and I gar- I DVDs, guarantee you, mark mark my words, VHS stores uh, or the like, whether it's a video store or whatever, whatever the format is. Are definitely going to make a big comeback. Well, there are there because, are subsects of people who like collect VHS. Well, yeah. well, it's because of the dearth of content. So yeah, I, yeah, and and that's something that uh, Phil Noble Jr., who's the the editor in chief of Fangoria, uh, towards the end of the film, he talks about this digital divide. So you know, every there there were huge amounts of material on VHS, but then everything moves over to DVD. And then you lose some of these. They don't. They don't move up to DVD, and then they all move to Blu-ray, and not everything makes the leap to Blu-ray. Tell me about. And so you have this. You know what originally was was a, a huge amount of material, wonderful movies. It gets a smaller and smaller and smaller I, scope, and then you get to 4K. You get to yeah, 8K. I, I can't tell you how many. You get to holograms. How it's many like homemade? Happen. Yeah, homemade. You know, I, I have tons of DVD Rs where I would I'd rent the movie 
you know, an old VHS that the, the film yep. is not on DVD, and I take it and I make DVD. And a and it's, it, it sounds more and more like you know, get off my lawn. But it's like we come from a generation <laughs> where you didn't have Rotten Tomatoes, you didn't have the internet to just give right. you a capsule review. All sure. you had was either what your friends told you, or a Fangoria, post- Fangoria, Fangoria yeah, yeah, or yeah. or you walked into a video store and you said, "Look at that box art. What does it mean yeah. to me? Right. right. What right. kind of movie do I want to watch? And if no one's looking, what kind of nudity or violence will I get to watch if right. my parents aren't home you know exactly that's, that's what you thought that's uh, sure <laughs> absolutely who, who were you <laughs> well, <laughs> as a as a teenager I, uh, like did you like the idea with it like a naked lady came on screen you were like eh. oh no oh yeah. this oh, is gosh. this is wrong <laughs> prudish wow you know, we're not. I'm going to he- cover my eyes with my Bible. We're not. No, no, no. Well, well th- no. This, this is this is a rite of passage for a lot of people who are going through their adolescence, and sure. when you finally yeah. got a little autonomy, whether you were watching, you know, uh, on cable. I mean, here, here, the first time I ever saw Friday the Thirteenth, I was too young because I was 12 years old. I couldn't get in the theater. But a year or two later, when it was on HBO, mm-hmm. I would sleep over at my particular friend's house, <laughs> oh, who had oh, HBO yeah. Yeah. not only downstairs, but he had HBO in his room. Oh, oh, so, so, hey, <laughs> let's sleep over at his house. Yeah. And at two in the morning, <laughs> wake up, wake up, Friday the 13th is on. And I'd watch Friday the 13th. That's awesome. Wow. And, that's a good friend. And through that, that's when you could see some nudity. And sure. Yeah. Oh. You, had, you had no one preventing you from doing this. Oh, and Betsy so, Palmer. And, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> and, yeah. So, 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 like a, a a seminal film, and the definition of seminal is that, I, like, I saw Humanoids from the Deep when I was. In, oh in, wow! Wow! And, and, and that, yeah. that movie that made me not want to have kids. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That movie is 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 special to me. It's not special to most people, but to me, it means something because I. Boy, I sat there and I just, you know, my mouth was agape at what I saw. Right, was, right. Not only did you have, you know, some some racy sex and nudity, mm-hmm. but you had these amazing killer monsters and some scary, scary stuff at yeah. the end. And, yeah. You know, I mean. And you, yeah. friend of the show, Greg Travis. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He's in there, yeah. But yeah, no, you're right. It was, like I said, like, you're right. You had the slasher boom, the 80s video boom, the, you know, all the makeup effects coming into their own. Like, all of that was in the 80s. And, you know, and now st- studios like Full Moon, you know, like Charles Band. That's right. Yeah. He was doing, yeah. you know, just straight to video be, and cheap, and they can do it, yep, and they they'll make money, so they did it. It was Empire back then, and then it evolved into Full Moon. Right. right. I actually worked for Full Moon <gasps> Entertainment in my early early years when really? it came out. No. Wow. Oh, yeah. Nice. Uh, coffee Lady? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was on Castaway. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, what'd you do? Uh, I, was, uh, I was a production assistant, but okay. I, like, I was, I was, yeah, I was a PA. I, I was a runner. That, that was my first job. You, you laundered, first... laundered some money for a uh, Charles <laughs> Band. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, no. So the comments. Ukraine come is on, financing oh, this. Come on, guys. Let's on. change this the is, subject. This no is all comments. just speculation here. Everyone, Sean, just, you know. just kidding. Please. <laughs> Let's see, this is some this, of these people are no, still alive. Sean, Sean. This, this is how rumors get started. Okay, let's yeah, just that's, say that's there might have right. been. No, some... no, no. The rumors did not start here. Okay. <laughs> Let's just say there may have been some shady things. I, I worked on I worked on demonic toys in, in lo, as an assistant location manager. Nice. I was uh, I did Puppet Master three. <gasps> as, oh, as oh our, our yeah. favorite, yeah. yeah, our favorite. Well, see and Courtney Joyner. Yeah, I, and so I mean I did second unit stuff on that, but I was cool. a, I was a AD and a, a you were an AD UPM AD on that. They one. They shot a lot in the Universal. Oh, same Universal same thing. Right? Same thing for Netherworld as well. Yeah. Oh. Cool. Cool. And uh, yeah, so <sighs> there you go. And you know, it's funny. Like I didn't even work on it but I felt like I worked on subspecies and you know like right. all these you know you're just it's all it's, it's a small company and sure. yeah, yeah 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 but I digress with the full moon but Charlie Band was was really a pioneer in in getting it pretty much the straight to video market yeah and uh you know so he also gave Stuart Gordon this amazing absolutely you know, chance Brian to, Usna. Yeah, so so they talk about them, you know, Jeffrey Combs, Brian Usna, Barbara Crampton, Barbara Crampton, uh, Stuart Gordon. They're oh. all talking about working with Charlie Band and what that what. That and they and they would do like. this little making of like featurettes on their videos, which are all really, which were so really great. Different. Back, they would do a little behind the scenes of subspecies, almost like or, a little show too yeah, that they did, really right? Cool, uh, full Gore, moon Gore kind zone of? or something. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Video zone or something. Yeah, something but, like yeah. that. Those yeah. are yeah, that was a cool. We ate, ate, ate all that stuff up. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing, too, when we talk about documentaries, is that as a bonus feature to a DVD, you know, he's got right. either a featurette or sometimes a quite long documentary 
for a bonus feature. Right, right, and, right. you know, that's when you really know that you, you made the right purchase. You're like, oh, look at all this extra stuff. Another cool stuff in, when we talk about this this video store experience, uh, Heather Wixon, who's managing editor of Daily Dead, she's in our film. She's also one of our producers. And... Um, she would go to Terror in the Isles, which yeah. is that for oh, us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Specifically, I mean, she enjoyed that movie, and it was very enlightening. It would just tell her about all these movies. Kind terror, of like what, terror in the Isles. It's called Terror yeah. in the Isles. And I remember you, that. And if you look at the box art of Terror in the Isles, it's basically a big skull, but it's got writing in it. When you look closely at the writing, it's got every single film that they talk about in the skull, in the writing. Right. So she would take this. And go down the horror aisle and say, "All right, I haven't heard of this one. I haven't heard of that one. Oh, I think I'll check that That's out." Great. And that was one of the Terry first. Terry recommended of, it. That was like one of the first, I think, theatrical release documentary, uh, you know, on the horror genre. What would you call in, in between that's entertainment one, two, and three? Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Right. But like, no, just, would that is it a documentary if it's just a series of scenes? Well, like that's but it, entertainment. But, that, but Terror on the yeah. Isles was was hosted by Donald Pleasance and Nancy Allen, and they would talk about they, the movies. And, and they stood in they, the aisles. Yeah, and they kind of they they actually. <laughs> but that's entertainment. Gave, but they gave social commentary on the. I haven't movies seen at that film in ages. Yeah, it's but, no, uh, it's. I mean, it's it's but, not. Maybe That's entertainment was more scenes, though, wasn't it? No, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, like Bing Crosby would right. would be introdu- he'd introduce a couple of the scenes, and, mm-hmm. and, and it was great. I love this entertainment. Yeah, One, but, like, but Terror and Isles was like a, a bit of an examination of, and it also I think it was Universal released it, so it was a lot of Universal titles. Yeah, it was titles. Very Universal okay. centric. Yeah, exactly. but still, it was like for the time, it was like, wow, this is cool. Like, and, I and, remember liking it. Was like it. I clip, think I, lots of clips, yeah. and I thought it was really cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that was one of the first ones I remember because it was done at the time in the eighties. Mm-hmm. You know. So yeah, it was cool. Now, when it comes to other documentaries, do you guys got some favorites <gasps> that immediately come to mind, Larry? Oh you, yeah. You want to talk about oh, yeah. something? Sure. Well, I mean, I have a, I have a huge list, but one of my favorites, as you guys know, I'm a huge Creature from the Black Lagoon fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in the Creature from the Black Lagoon from Universal Studios, it has the three pack. It has Creature, Revenge of the Creature, and The Creature Walks Among Us. There's a great. That's the one where he wears the fedora. <laughs> <laughs> and we come full circle. Yes. No. Oh, wait. No, no that's, that's Uncle, Uncle Gilbert, Gilbert oh, okay, from sorry. The Monster. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just, you know, yes, reco- yes, recollection. Okay. Uh, yes, that's classic, that, classic monster party humor. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, just like uh, Sean's liver, that thing. Uh, yeah. Kind of, oh. Never goes away. Yes, but but what's great about this is it's directed by David J. Scal, and it's a very detailed look at the making of the creature from the Black Lagoon. It has interviews with Julie Adams and Ben Chapman, and Riku Browning, and Laurie Nelson from Revenge of the Creature. Mm -hmm. And so it's great. You actually had people that were still alive just to be interviewed, and they told some great stories. But also, you have. Great interviews with Bob Burns and David Scow, who was a guest on our show, and uh, David uh, Schechter, who helped Tom Weaver write the book Creature Chronicles. And so you got a lot of information about the creature. And as a creature fan, I loved it. And I sucked all this up. This was so fantastic. This was the documentary I always wanted. Hmm. They talk a little bit about Millicent Patrick, hmm. who is credited for designing the look right. of the creature. However, they don't go into as much detail as... Mallory O'Meara's new book that just book, came yeah. out, uh, which is called The Lady from the Black Lagoon, right. Hollywood Monsters and the Lost Legacy of Millicent Patrick. Mallory O'Meara does a great, in-depth, detailed job at finding out all Give, the information. Yeah, and giving her credit where credit is oh due, Oh, my God. And, and so it's like it's like after reading that book, I feel like I've, I've kind of got all the creature knowledge, you know? Mm. But that documentary is such a great documentary. Well, what, what an interesting element that you you mentioned with all the people who are in it, and I could talk about my documentary the same way. And essentially, all of these documentaries, when you're having interviews with these people, as they get grayer, as the wrinkles you know yeah. appear, these are time capsules. Yes, yeah, totally. these these are these are important documents. It sounds super serious, and it's it's but the, it's the truth. However, way you want to look at it. These people aren't going to be around forever, no. and we're not going to be around forever. So these are wonderful documents about the making of some of our favorite movies. Yes. And I think I think the horror documentary and any documentary for that specific example, there's there's tremendous importance to Absolutely. any of these exercises. They're archival. And you were talking about these documentaries that are on the discs yes. of the creature films, mm-hmm. and that is part of a series 
mm-hmm. that Universal put out called the Legacy Series, mm-hmm. the Legacy Collection. Yeah. And I think they did a great job across the board when yeah. it came to yeah, all, all of them. their the Invisible Man documentary. Every one of Dracula, them was great. Yeah. You had mm-hmm. like, you know, David J. Scowl and uh, Rudy Belmer and, you know, yep. and you had these film historian guys who could be dry, but aren't. They're so they're passionate, passionate yeah, right. about mm. these films and they have just a wealth of information. And so you get a really in-depth look at each one of these films so i would strongly suggest to get that legacy collection yeah. and i think they're re-releasing it uh in blu-ray all of them yeah yeah and uh and i'm sure all of those documentaries are going to be on there well and th- there's one that's missing is that right th- there's there was one that made in 1997 just called universal horror yes okay that was i think turner classics or yeah, amc one of those and it was narrated by kenneth Branagh. yes mm-hmm. and it was terrific it was it 19- was tcm it was kenneth Branagh. it was very good it was tied into when he did frankenstein correct yeah yes yeah it was but not, it's very it was well done was that on this frankenstein disc well, that's the problem. I think Universal put it on one of the Dracula reissues years ago, but it's not on the new Blu-rays, and oh. I'm kind of disappointed at that. It's a good overall of, yeah. the, of yeah, all yeah. of all the Universal stuff. Yeah, it's ninety yeah. minutes. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Can well, I can I say I was very pleased to be able to put the poster for The Bride in my movie? Uh, <laughs> yes. No one remembers that movie, I and know, maybe no yeah. one should. Yeah. But it, but it came out Actually, in the eighties. That's 80s weird. You say that because now. I mean, I think I saw it like on cable way back, but I, I hey, have Jennifer no memory. Beals no, is that any good? St- stings in it, right? Yeah, Jennifer Beals. Sting. Jennifer Beals. Yeah. I kind of want to see it again now. Well, you know, know, from Flashdance. One of the first. <laughs> one yeah. of the, I'm a fan. That horror film. One of the very first movies that comes up, if not the first, is The Changeling. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, love oh this movie. is going to be fun. Because you're going to cover the gamut. <laughs> yeah. Sure, right. sure. Yeah. This is what George C. Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Great yeah. Brief, brief, briefly about my approach is I think a lot of people, when they think of the 80s, they think of slashers and they kind of forget yeah. that there's supernatural. You know, there's, yeah. there's the whole fantastic element. Ghost and, Story. Yeah. yeah. Ghost, Ghost yeah. Story gets, yeah, I don't think that movie gets enough And then love. Poltergeist. No one has heard of Poltergeist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. please stop. Um, well, talk about how you say about chronicling stuff that, you know, is important to have historically. Two really good documentaries that are just so super in depth on horror franchises from the eighties. One is called Never Sleep Again, The mm-hmm. Elm Street Legacy. Great. From 2010. Fantastic. They I mean, kind of like your film, how it covers by year, they go into detail for each film and the whole franchise. And it's just really what the good and the bad, you know, they of the ones that were better than others, the one that the changes them had to make and how each one was was you know received. It covers all of them, and just as good and as in-depth is uh, Crystal Lake Memories, mm-hmm. the history of Friday the 13th. Which, which, produced which, by the same people, I right? think so, yes. yeah. Another uh, just, uh, just Daniel Farrens. So well done, and just, again, and they get a lot of these actors and actresses who play in these movies, and the victims, and the filmmakers, and it's just like, you know, if you're a fan, it's it's fantastic. Well, both both of those films solely for their running time. Yes, they're f- they're, they're they're wonderful films. They have amazing casts. They they're quality films. Yeah, but solely for their running time, that gave me encouragement that I could do. Yes. Yeah. A, a long film and horror fans will care. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. those are really good. Um, and uh, never sleep again. Just to tie it sure. to uh, one of our past guests. Apparently, David Scow for that documentary found some tape. Because he worked on Freddy's Nightmares. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. And that was a little bit of original, never before seen right, footage right, right. that he was able to bring to that documentary. That's and, awesome. And that's the thing I love too about these documentaries is that more often than not, you'll get to see something you've never seen before. Right. Mm-hmm. right. Or stories about stories. That you had yeah. No idea. Footage. Um, along the same lines, just real quick, is one that was made a couple years earlier. Uh, Going to Pieces: The Rise and Fall of the Slasher mm-hmm. Film. That's another. And good that's one. a good because like you obviously you, you hit on the slasher. Boot in your film but this this is like a look at the whole origin of how that started with yeah. Halloween but also looking at you know like Psycho and Peeping Tom and and how all the way up to like you know New Year's Evil My Bloody Valentine but they cover the, that whole genre really well and that's a good one too yeah there was one um, from 2007 about Jaws called The Shark is Still Working yeah <laughs> oh. J, J. Michael Roddy yeah. is that on the Wait, Blu-ray it's, called- it's on the Jaws Blu-ray and it's it's long I think it's like two hours mm-hmm. I think it was initially um, generated by like hardcore fans who just oh, wanted wow. to do this cool. thing. And it covers, I mean, it is 
comprehensive, man. It's exhaustive. They interview the guy who did the voice on the trailer. <laughs> and, and he's one of the people they dedicate it to. They, oh, they nice. go to Jaws Fest in Martha's Vineyard. Mm. There's Quint lookalike contest. <laughs> That's and, awesome. And, of course, everybody who's still alive who's in it, it's narrated by Roy Scheider. The, one of the one of the things that amazed me is that when Steven Spielberg was looking at the Oscar nominations the morning they came out, somebody must have had a sixteen millimeter camera. Yeah, they filmed it. They, right? They filmed it. Oh my god! And Joe Spinell is sitting there in his office <laughs> wearing a Jaws counterfeit T shirt. Right, right. And, and <laughs> like blood all over it. And it's and way it was, too it was tight. One of those like hand drawn. And oh and, my god. and he's like outraged that Spielberg didn't get nominated. I was like, what the hell is Joe Spinell doing hanging out with Spielberg? <laughs> But that's, that's, awesome. that's one of the things that you can get out of these. Yeah, yeah. That, that are put together by fans who, who know the intrinsic value of this material and want to share it with other fans. That's right, right. priceless, by the way. That do is just priceless. You, do you know what year that one is? Because there were a number of Jaws documentaries. There was one that was on the laser disc. Yeah, the, the funny thing about. And I like them all. Yeah, even like True Hollywood Story did a Jaws. In right, the Teeth right. of Jaws. Right. <laughs> Jaws. Which is great. Jaws from Hanging on the screen. Fin of Jaws. Jaws, the Inside Story. The, and they're all great. They're oh, all yeah. really fun documentaries. Cool. The, the Shark is Still Working is so comprehensive that they include an interview with Laurent Bozzaro, who did the laser disc making of oh, Jaws. Oh, there you go. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. That's great. Uh, okay, so it's called The Shark is Still Working. Oh, yeah, yeah. and it's awesome. Oh, it, and there's this whole thing about what happened to the orca, <laughs> which is like tragic. Yeah. The ship, the, ship? the oh, actual, yeah. just, the actual yeah. boat. Yeah. Yeah. When I saw Jaws, I just have to throw in a quick aside. I saw it late to the game because I was too young to see it. Now, uh, after Jaws had come and gone and then came back to the theater later, Orca had come out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And now I saw Orca before I saw Jaws. Oh, wow. And so when I saw Jaws and it said Orca, I got yeah. very confused. <laughs> you know, right. that's one of James's favorite films, by the way. I love it. I'm like, I'm like hey, it. they're making a reference to Orca and Jaws. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that movie so much. And the stories are just great. It seemed like, you know, with the, in the teeth of Jaws and each documentary, you got a little bit more. I would love to see all of those documentaries cut together yeah. into that five-hour, yeah. you know, definitive doc. And, and unless you had a DVD recorder and recorded them, when, when they were right. showing those, right. it's hard to find them. Yeah. yeah. Um, I believe in Search of Darkness, is it true that you, you guys are the last to interview Larry Cohen? I don't know if we're the last last, but we're essentially the last. Yeah, because uh, he has some great stories yeah, in there. He, I, we might have been his last uh, long form interview, right? Uh, but he, he sadly passed about yeah. two and a half months after I talked to him in his home. And, it, oh man! And, and Larry Cohen had brought us some great movies. King such, Cohen. Well, well, well that's well, what well, we want to bring well, up. That's the documentary. Yeah, yeah. 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 the Cohen. movies he didn't bring us, but yeah, King Cohen is the documentary. The Wild sort of World of Filmmaker ahead. Larry Cohen. Yeah. Which is it's wonderful. Wonderful. Talk about great stories. And, uh, and our, our pal Taylor White is one of the producers on that it's as so well. Good. Yeah, it's, it's really well so done. Great. I love that one. But yeah, Larry, Larry Cohen, amazing films. I mean, uh, Q gets some some sp specific <laughs> love in our yeah, film. Yeah. Yes. Talk as well as the stuff. I mean, it was a real treat to be able to talk to Larry because he was fine. He had energy. He had spunk. He had a sense of humor. Like did, yeah. we, we, we ended up dedicating the film to yeah, him. Yeah. But, but having him talk about like the stuff and how you know you can't treat actors like you could the stuff. The stuff, I could beat the <laughs> shit out of it. it, it I didn't right. care. And it had to do what I told, you know, told it to do. Now, when you, I, I think you mentioned that you told me a story about when you interviewed him. Didn't, didn't he show you some oh, spooky his, props or... He infamously has this this monster closet in his home <laughs> where he keeps Don't a lot all. of his stuff. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I was just, I wanted to see the "It's Alive" baby. I, I, he's got this amazing collection of his greatest hits in a closet. So you've got the stuff for the stuff. That's awesome. Uh, he's like he's got the the stuff containers. He's got stuff oh, from I, Q. I, like he's got like the uh, the the baby Q. Eggs in there, oh, and, nice. and he's got and he's got the from It's Alive three Island of the Alive, which I cover in my film because that's his eighties right, It's Alive right. movie. He has the adult sized baby <laughs> costumes awesome. in there. Did you put it on? I, well, I put it over my shoulder. I, I took a picture with him and that, like in between us, like the three of us were buddies going that's out for a drink. Awesome. That's and awesome. uh, boy, talk that about costume talk about saved my song. marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wearing it right now. <laughs> James, you mentioned about how some of these 
certain specials or, or documentaries kind of came and went. You couldn't see them again. Right. There is one that I really remember that was on CBS that was aired in 1979 called The Horror Show. Mm. And it was like a two hour special on horror films hosted by Anthony Perkins. Mm. Wow. And he would like come out on these spooky stairs like horror. What is horror <laughs> to us? And, like, <laughs> and he would just and he would show clips, just kinda a little bit like vaguely remember. A little that. bit like Terror in the Isles, but but uh, I think before that. And and it was just um I just remember as a kid because they would show clips from all the films and he would talk about, you know, it's like a roller coaster ride and it's a way to escape and all this stuff. But it was like, you know, a two hour special on TV about horror movies. It was I, great. I, I would argue that I cut my teeth on documentaries watching In Search of with Leonard Nemo. Oh, oh, don't get me started. Oh, which was a weekly <laughs> documentary it. essentially on the yes. true things in the world. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the the UFOs, the cryptozoology's greatest yeah. hits. Yes. 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 But but it's great though. It was, they were done succinctly in half an hour. Yeah. Like now now they they'll do a whole freaking season of a show yeah. on one thing. Like they did it like See, I learned how to do things succinctly but not in a half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They were <laughs> They were the trailblazers of bullshit, <laughs> paranormal <laughs> yeah, reality much. TV. But it was Leonard Nimoy, Wait a so you had to believe bullshit? it, though. Aww. Yeah, that was that was. I love those. So I think what's really cool about a lot of the documentaries that have that have come out uh, that are, are faves of mine are '80s centric. Sure, and. Um, you know, yeah, like what I, are some other ones like? Well, I think I think we'd be remiss and we didn't talk about Room Two Three Seven, oh, which, oh, which which, which no. all I could say is that is a drain on the brain. Yeah. Now, now because, for because, listeners who don't know, could you tell us what Room Two Three Seven? It's an exhaustive documentary. It's the second time I've word, used the word exhaustive, but it's a uh, it dives into the conspiracy theories of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. It's amazing because you go down the rabbit hole with oh. everyone there, and yeah. you get to the About point five where, different people, right? Yeah, yeah. it's and, kind of it's kind of hilarious and annoying at the same time. Well, like, I you, love it. I, you know, I love it because what I love about that film is that it is different. It's not very your much. everyday documentary. Yeah, and some of these. Theories. It's I mean, like, my God, it's yeah. this weird it's, psychological torture. I began to start one. First, I was wondering if these guys were were for real. I'm like, yeah, do yeah. really believe this to be true, or is this fabricated for you know this film? Right. It, it, they were that far out. Well, yeah, yeah. some but, of but, them. But, but some they, of them. Well, some... they were so okay. Yeah, well, wait a minute. Thing, James, All right. Wait. No, no, no. James, <laughs> James is right though. The thing is, they they so methodically detail. Why they believe this is true, right. and then and then back it up with all of the footage and their right. take on right. and, on <laughs> wait, the footage. Wait a minute, and you start to think, well, maybe it is. True. Wait, no, well, no, no, no. Look, look, James, look, look. which one did you believe? Look, look, I don't, I don't. <laughs> which believe, one did you believe? I don't believe any of the those. moon landing. I'm the moon. <laughs> yes, the moon landing sticks out, but I'm I'm fascinated by the fact that these people believe it. Where it started to lose me finally was when the guy started to play it backwards. It's like, oh no, 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 uh, no that no, was no. fun. That's just by, that's but, just but, gravy. But I, it, it wasn't compelling enough. The fact that these people were interpreting it and thought enough about it to apply all of this, I don't know, imagination or focus or whatever, that was fascinating to me. And, yeah, and yeah. that's what made it so entertaining. It's like being like, stuck in a room with it's a the thing, shining it's, fanatic. It's the th- yeah. it, it just goes to show you, human beings seek patterns. Yes, and if you want to... L- ec- explanation. Yeah, and if you want to find a pattern, you can find it. Well, like the know, whole thing about the American Indians <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. Yeah. and that it's because really that about movie, Indian genocide. And because that movie is so obtuse and can be interpreted in so many different ways, yes. people, it's not like a, this is not a by the numbers movie in any way. You it's know, like, it's so. almost like it must be about something else. Yeah, yeah. No, it's about Native Americans. You <laughs> know, well, you know, I, I learned that the moon landing is indeed fake because I did see Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or Capricorn I, One. I just, One. But I, I exactly. love I love the... Well, we did go to Mars, right? right? right. What they don't get into is that they don't get into their own mind about, okay, so Stanley Kubrick is just sitting around guilty about the moon landing, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll confess in The Shining. What? Well, there, right, right. There, there is a whole sequence where, where one of these people analyzes the set and, and how it's impossible for Danny to be doing this whole hallway, you know, and how the layout is constructed. It's like, well, it is a movie set after all. It's not an <laughs> actual hotel. Editing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, the Ukraine funded most of The Shining, I think. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the director of the film actually has a take on all these theories. Rodney Asher. Mm-hmm. And he says, my personal take on it is, for one, I don't think it's nearly as visionary as any one of these folks have found, meaning The Shining. He says, I just see it as sort of a story about juggling the responsibilities of your career and family and as 
cautionary tale of what may happen if you make the wrong choice. And even maybe looking at the ghosts as these figures that represent fortune or prestige or things that you might be chasing at the expense of paying proper attention to your family. It's a movie. <laughs> it's a movie. That's, it's a movie. You know, you know, in the small world, having nothing to do with anything, uh, Rodney, who makes this, made this film, uh, shares an office with Alex Winter, who's in my film. Oh. And oh, so cool. when I was interviewing Alex, he's like, oh, wait, you got to go meet Rodney. Cause oh, nice. And he was right there. Wow. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. Hey, cool. pleasure to meet you. I love that film. Yeah, and no, I it's think it's great. And it's, it's fascinating. It's bonkers, but yeah. It's crazy. And yeah. it's very entertaining. And I was fascinated at how these people who have these theories can rationalize them and have them all <laughs> kind of worked out almost mathematically right, like right. Uh, a beautiful mind. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, they, they take that genius on the spectrum kind of skill and apply it to the shining well, and manage to make this theory somehow make sense. <laughs> right. I think part of what's so fun is that, well, come on, we all have thoughts that wander and we try to make sense out of them. And sometimes you can go a little too far. <laughs> Do you want to say something, sir? Speaking, speaking for myself, anyway. <laughs> all right. Larry? Oh, can I talk now? Please. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, okay, we're all talking about stuff in the 80s. You know, I wanted to go to a documentary that wasn't made a long time ago, but it was made about a film that was made a long time ago. Uh -huh. And I'm talking about the documentary RKO Production 601. Oh, yeah. The Making of King Kong. Ah. Mm. And this is such a great in-depth documentary. Now, this documentary was made specifically for uh, home video. It came out in 2005 specifically for the release of King Kong mm -hmm. on, on DVD. And this was in, in uh, relation to Peter Jackson's King Kong that was coming around at the same time. And talk about an in-depth documentary. I mean, they go all out. And the, the amount of people that are in there, it's amazing. You've got uh, interviews with Ray Harryhausen, Joe Dante, the Monster Party guest, uh, Rich Carell, mm -hmm. who talks a lot about King Kong, along with Rick Baker, Bob Burns, John Landis, Frank Darabont, Greg Nicotero, David Scal, Phil Tippett, and Peter Jackson, and Faye Ray, one of her last uh. interviews. I mean, and there's more people that are interviewed, but they talk about the whole history behind Miriam C. Cooper and Ernest Schoensack and how they got into filmmaking and the whole creation of King Kong. I mean, they talk about the, the history of these guys and how they came about to, to make King Kong and how they were both adventurers and stuff. And it's such a great documentary. And not only does it go into great detail about how they, their, their history, how they got the film made and all the stuff they went through, but also there's this famous spider pit uh, sequence that mm -hmm, everyone mm -hmm. talks about that it was in the script but was it ever shot? You know, wow. some people don't know, but Peter Jackson does his own interpretation of it, and that's in this as well. And it's a great documentary, and this is over two and a half hours long. Oh, wow. Now, was that available on the King Kong disc? Yeah, it was. Well, it came together the, in the, the, in the, the, the remake. On the, on the, no, 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 no. On that tin. No, this the was tin the tin. that came out. Oh, on the tin. tin. Oh, okay, so, okay. So it was, so what you could do is you could buy the King Kong a DVD all by itself, or there was a special collector's oh, okay. edition disc. It's beautiful. Which, which I have. It's a tin, and you open it up, and oh, ooh, oh ooh. it's beautiful. And, and, look at that. Know, and look, ah. what's well, great is when King Kong opened at Grandma's Chinese Theater, they have a reproduction of the program. Oh, oh that's beautiful. And, and so it's on this that it comes with that extra DVD. Now, you can find it on YouTube now. Okay. And I've checked, and it's like a ton of people have watched it, and it's a very popular, but it's, if you want to know the really true behind the scenes history of King Kong check out this documentary I would also add as a double feature with that Long Live the King mm. 2016 documentary uh, uh, yes, yes. made by our friends Frank, Frank Dietz. Dietz and Trish Geiger yes uh -huh. which I also have here on my list oh you do yes. do you want to talk about it no Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, go. <laughs> wow. It's about King Kong. Yeah. Right. It really talks about the longevity of King Kong. Yeah, yeah. And Dana uh, Gould's in it. Dana Gould. And, uh, you know, you got Greg Nicotero and Doug Jones. And, yeah, there's all kinds of the people that we've had on the show and, you know, people we'd like to have. Joe Dante. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> King Kong we'd love to have on the show. Yeah. But. And they also did Beast Wishes, oh, the yeah, fantastic yes. world of Bob and Kathy Burns. Oh, mm. I love Bob. Now, the great thing about this, guys, is you know this documentary takes this heartfelt look at the imaginative world of Bob and Kathy Burns. And if you don't know these people, oh, yeah. look them up. Google them. First of all, there's a great book called Bob's 
basement. It came from Bob's basement. It came mm-hmm. from Bob's yes. basement. Right. Now, Bob Burns is this guy who's he's been in the industry for years. He's been known as like a gorilla man, the guy who would always yeah, gorilla, gorilla suit gorilla actor. Right. Yes. Uh, he's yeah. probably best known for the TV show, the kids' TV show Ghostbusters, the original Ghostbusters. Yeah, where way he, before. Yeah, way before. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. But, but he was known as this gorilla guy, but he was well known within the effects world. And what he loved to do is he loved Halloween. And he would put on these, you know, when, when people would decorate their houses in Halloween, this is back in the late 60s, early 70s. Bob, because he was kind of an effects guy and stuff, he would build these sets on the front of his house and make like these experiences. This was Elaborate. Here, this, um, and this was here in mazes. the Los Angeles area, okay? And his house was really well known. Oh, that's the ho- a Halloween guy, you yeah. know? And they would go make these really elaborate scenes and every year it'd be a, a, a more and more elaborate. They did a, a creature from the Black Lagoon scene one year. They did a, a thing one year. They did an alien one where Walter Koenig, who was buddies, you know, he go, Walter said, hey, you know, I know you do these little shows. I like to do that. And Bob said, well, sure, We'd love to have you do it, but you know we do show after show after show after show because you're trying to get in as many people as you want. And Walter talked to us about it, yeah, and how, how much fun it was. It was sure. exhausting. Yeah. Well, that sounds, that sounds terrific. Because 20th Century Fox gave them the sets because they didn't need them anymore. No. They didn't yeah. want to keep them. And I found out about Bob Burns and his his Halloween shenanigans and Walter Koenig doing that from Starlog magazine. Yeah, yeah. Right. 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 covered in that. Yeah, yeah. But but the film Beast Wishes it shows some footage. It shows a lot of the props that and over the years these special effects guys are guys who helped to build stuff for Bob's right. scenes went on to become these special effects geniuses like Dennis Murin for mm-hmm. example who went off to be this genius at ILM and and James Cameron they they've given him over the years props from all these great films that they worked on I've been there yeah. you too oh, Sean yeah. right yeah it's fantastic yeah. and walked around his place and he's got everything he's yeah, got man. this amazing collection of horror and sci-fi props and masks from the Star Wars cantina scene and the original time machine, the That's alien amazing. queen. I, I have I have held the armature for the Me original too. King Kong Me in my too. hands. I, I almost cried. I felt yeah. the electricity <laughs> yeah. of everyone who held that since Willis O'Brien. Our friend Dana Gould in the documentary is talking about how, you know, he goes to Bob's place and actually is able to touch the Plan 9 saucer. Mm -hmm. And what he says is basically, why am I allowed to touch this? (laughs) (laughs) Now, it's funny. You mentioned uh, Dana Gould. Just a lot of other people who are huge fans of Bob and Kathy Burns, and many of these people are interviewed, such as uh, Rick Baker Mm -hmm. and Joe Dante, John Goodwin, Mike Hill, John Landis, Will Malone, Dennis Murin, Greg Nicotero, David Scow, Chris Wayless, Steve Wang, Tom Woodruff Jr. And these, this is just to name a few. Yeah. And these are all people who are giants within the effects world or horror community. You asked Bob Burns, like, how did you get such a collection? And you think, well, he's such a nice guy. Everybody's like, well, you got to give him props. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, he's back. I see what you did there. <laughs> well, if I can throw out one. Um, Please. There used to be a cable channel called Monsters HD. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was wonderful. Yeah, it and was. Of course, and of course, it got chopped off. Of course. Yeah. Like all great things. It was things. great. Yes. Yeah, in 2009, it ended. But um, there was an original show called Monsterama. Right. I'm so oh, happy that you're bringing yes. this up. It was maybe 15 minutes each episode, yeah. and they did maybe 25 episodes. Elvira hosted it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Many of them, if not all of them, were uh, written and produced by Dan Roebuck. Right. Another yeah. uh-huh. show. There would be like a specific little area of the genre. Right. And, Former guest of the show. Yeah. Yes. And Dan himself had a character called Dr. Shocker. Right. He's kind of mad <laughs> right. scientist TV host. Uh-huh. Many of the episodes, I mean, they covered so many different topics. Aurora Monster Kids. Yeah. Aurora Monster Kids. Who, who talks about that now? You know, it's like, yeah. Uh, Basil Gogo's art. Planet of the Apes. Planet mm-hmm. of the Apes, Dawn Post Masks, Monsters Memorabilia, Planet of the Apes Memorabilia. The thing is, a lot of them focused on collecting and collectibles. Yeah. yeah. And that, great. And no, pure heaven. Nothing else really did that on a regular basis. No. Yeah, no. yeah, that's true. And, and they interviewed actual collectors, uh, the creature, big creature from the Black Lagoon episode, Godzilla episode. It was awesome. It's yeah, it was so really good. good. And, and you know, apparently there is a channel on YouTube that's showing these things, but you go on there and it says private video. It's like, damn uh, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, this is good. I just want to throw out, Dan also did another uh, great documentary called Halloween, The Happy Haunting of America. What I love about this documentary, it's, it's he plays his Dr. Shocker character, mm-hmm. but they talk about 
all great Halloween things that are done all across the country in America. I mean, he was on our show. He was on our Halloween Extravaganza episode, and he talks about how America made Halloween great. <laughs> and in this documentary, which was made in 1997, they go across the country and go to all these towns and, and see what various places do for, for Halloween. And mm-hmm. it's, it's so wonderful. Mm. Well, on the, on the subject of Dan Roebuck, I, I would be remiss if I did not include that in 2006, Dan and our other good friend Wally Wingert produced a documentary for the Groovy Ghoulies DVD box That's set. That's right. <laughs> yes. Called it's... Ghoulians, a docu-comedy, <laughs> which features uh, Larry Stroth. That's right. Pre-Monster Party. That's, right. <laughs> running, <laughs> running, That's running, where we discovered him. <laughs> <laughs> running around in full vampire mode. Okay, uh, okay. Now, I just want to say, I was helping out. Okay? It was awesome. They, you you they, made the show. I did make the show. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in, in fact, I, I bring some good comedic moments. You, you know, really, you, you, you saved that documentary. Well, <laughs> yeah. you really did. You know, I did this whole vampire thing, you know, you know, and and I I heard that all the letters that we get about no 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 your I had groovy ghoulies there was appearance. All, there was all this funny stuff I did with you know everyone's trying to dance and I'm in the background trying to like flap my cape. It was yeah, really funny. Yeah, but was it funny. ended up on the cutting room floor. That was, oh. that, was, that was on the groovy ghoulies DVD set. Yes, yes. which yes. I think had some really well written liner notes for that. I think I, I, I have a yeah, groovy ghoulies. Yeah, by some guy named Sean Sheridan. Oh, oh he he is good. He does yeah, good work. Yeah. I, have, I have a groovy Ghoulies confession, and that I watched it all the time when I was a kid. Me but, too. But I rewatched it because I hadn't watched it in, in in a long time, and I wanted to see if my son was down for it. <laughs> so I was watching, and I was just like, "This is laughing." Yeah. Yes. Oh, exactly. I, but, but, exactly. But I was oblivious to that fact when sure. I was yeah. a kid. Yeah. Sure. But it was just, it's a carbon copy. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and that really Laughing kind of blew my monsters. mind a little bit. Well, yeah. well let me tell you something. Uh-oh. Okay. No, this is there what we I go. Want, this is what He's I want to tell you. He's about ready to explode. No, 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 no. <laughs> I because Wally and Dan were friends. They said, "Hey, we need some help. Can some guys come down? You know, and and we're going to film this thing. And can you bring like a little costume?" I said, "Sure, I'm going to help out." But I was never a fan of the Groovy Goons. Do you know why? Because they made fun of the monsters, and I took my monsters seriously as a kid. They're like, oh, the, I needed that. I did a joke, and that's driving me batty. See, you laugh. Well, they were, I was insulted. They were poking I fun know. at themselves. No, I don't exactly. want my monsters to you be poking fun. You don't want to have fun. Okay. No, no, well, You Sean. didn't have to watch it. Well, yeah. well, Why are you so yeah. enraged? Larry, Larry, Larry like, did you wait feel... Wait Mad Larry? Monster Party. I Thank uh, you. I was going to go right to Mad okay. Monster Party. Yeah. Okay, okay. What do you think of that? That's not that the topic. Excuse? Well, no, what is that? No, is no, that okay? No, I'm not done yet. Is I'm, that okay? I'm not done. Answer the question. <laughs> I am not done, sir. <laughs> you can't handle the Mad Monster truth. <laughs> well, let me tell are you... Are you? Have you ever been a Monster fan? <laughs> now, listen, listen. At the end of the filming, they say, okay, now what we want is we want everyone to come to the camera... <coughs> oh God! <excuse> me. <laughs> want Please stand by, everybody. Want mummy's you. curse. Listen, the funny mummy's curse. To come to the camera and say which character was your favorite, and when you look at everyone saying who their favorite monster is, you know who's missing me. You know why? Because you said the sponsors. <laughs> because I didn't have a favorite groovy ghoulian. You protest. Wow. I did. Yes. Uh, by the way, way, not by the way it's the groovy ghoulies. Yes. Larry, groovy not ghoulies. the groovy ghoulians. Yes. You can't yeah. even get yes. the name of the Goul- show. Yeah. Ghoulian was the name Goulian of the documentary. The, documentary. the you know show what? is it, called the Groovy Way ghoulies. to not get in a documentary. Yeah. Wow. Larry, Larry, it's important to stand up for your beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. Stand by <laughs> them. Draw a line. But, yeah. if, but if you don't like monster comedy like that, what about Mad Monster Party? What about Mad Monster Party? What about Mad Monster Party? Party. Yes, that's, I so, that's so goofy and silly. I, I, that's right, and I had a problem with that too. You did? Oh. I did. Okay. All right. I did. Well, at least you're. Consistent. What about Young Frankenstein? <sighs> oh boy, that is tough. Wow. Is I it? remember seeing. <laughs> yes. You know, because I remember. Oh, <laughs> just okay. do you like it or not? It's, no, it's no, really funny. no, 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 no. Oh, oh, so <laughs> it's, it's an easy bl- question. It's, it's black and white to you, right? If it's funny or not, yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is my story. When I saw the poster, mm-hmm. I was enraged because I enraged. thought enraged. I thought He's they're making fun enraged. of they're making fun of Frankenstein. And so you know what I did when that film came out? I didn't see it. Uh-huh. I you showed them boycott it. So variety it headlines: Larry Strode <laughs> boycotts Young Frankenstein. But David, I will say that walks out at opening credits. The box office <laughs> suffered definitely. I'm yeah. I'm just saying I I refuse to see it. I'm just saying. Wait, I currently? No. We, I, okay. When it came out. I refused. Okay. Okay. And it, I didn't see it for a long time. Okay. And when it. And then you got medication. No. And <laughs> No. So someone had rented it on, on uh, uh, a VHS. And I, I watched it 
reluctantly. I I watched it like you know, you know. Okay. But you know what? I started to watch it, and as I started to watch it, number one, I did find it funny, and I also found that it wasn't so much making fun of it as it was almost like it was almost like a, an homage. The, they they kind of I think they loved it. it was you know, yeah, yeah. yeah no there shit. was. Well, I'm just they saying. Did, yeah. Well, I didn't see affection in the groovy ghoulies. How do you? Well, because you've already made up your mind before you went in. No. That's the thing. So you, you you made a wrong <laughs> assumption. I mean, but then you saw it and loved it. And you it you must movie. have been a lot of fun as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> I mean, like you can't wow. just go with like they, yeah. just because someone is taking a satirical look at something that we love doesn't mean they hate it. And also, it doesn't completely eliminate the source material. You still have Frankenstein and all those movies. In, in, you know what? In defense of Larry, I understand. Oh, here I we under- go. Well, no. Now, go ahead, Weiner. <laughs> I, I listen. I un- I understand if if something rubs you the wrong way as a kid, and you know it sort of defines how you look at things. Uncle and, Gilbert. And that doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean <laughs> that doesn't mean you have to be consistent across the line, and you can like some things and you could dislike things, and I, I understand that. And I just well, wanted to get. I just you, wanted David. to pick away at that scab of psychology. <laughs> That's all. But here's my thing with the groovy ghoulies is that you can have a problem with that because it's not really that funny. Mm. That's the problem. It's not that... Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's not It's also funny a all. kid's yeah. cartoon. Well, the thing it's is, a kid's I, cartoon. I, I, I've, I've got some serious problems with the wacky racers. <laughs> okay, no, 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 no. Now, no, the haunted car... Yeah, I'm just saying it. Like, the caveman it it car pro- does not properly reflect NASCAR. Does not true. properly that's reflect true. the. If you're a NASCAR 100. fan, you would be offended. The uh, yeah. rules of the road Cannon, are constantly. I found yeah, Cannonball Run to be much more realistic. <laughs> right. Okay. One of my favorite um, horror. Okay. Back, series. back to is, is there another documentary you want yes. to talk about? Um, I would like to talk about. There's certain films that become so historically interesting or infamous that they need a whole documentary on them. Um, one would be the movie Troll 2, ah, yes. uh, which was made a great film called Best Worst Movie, mm-hmm. 2009. Yeah, that, that is good. Uh, made by the actor who plays the little kid in the movie. Yes, yeah. And uh, it's fascinating because it's, you know, this this is a movie that was done, I mean, the original Troll from the 80s uh, was not exactly a great movie, but uh, then for some reason, Italian filmmakers decide to make a Troll 2 and not put any actual trolls in the movie. Um, and and it's, it, they, the main character is played by a dentist who yeah. wasn't even an actor. And but it's a fascinating look at like... Very reminiscent of Plan 9 and the reality of that. Yeah, and like the love-hate relationship, that the, the journey that these the actors had with this thing because like the director, the Italian director didn't really understand you know that the people are making fun of it, and it's just it's, it's fascinating. It's really funny. I mean, the movie itself is really entertaining in a completely what the fuck kind of way. But the best worst movie documentary is is just as fascinating. I love that. Um, another one along that same line is uh, a film called Lost Soul: The Doomed Journey of Richard Stanley. This yeah. is 2014, and this is about the whole making of the 90s version of <gasps> The Island of Dr. Moreau. No, I've which, seen that. It's fantastic. And the movie the movie is definitely like a train wreck of a movie. I do find it entertaining. We've talked which about I that before. Which I stand by. I yeah, stand too. by. I'm I agree. I'm on I, that hill. I, it's fa- Me but, too. But, but you watch the movie, but then you watch this documentary, and it's even more fascinating yes. and more entertaining. What this filmmaker went through, the, the challenges and how it kind of just fell apart, and he was replaced as a director, it's amazing. It's fascinating. It's funny. It's insane. <laughs> All the stories of Brando behind the scenes mm. and just what they went through. It's really amazing. So what's that one called again? It's called Lost Soul, The Doomed Journey of Richard Stanley. And Richard Stanley, I mean, he just himself such is a, a character. It's just uh, an amazing character in this film. And uh, and I believe it was Mike Mendez who was saying that uh, he's met him a number of times. Oh, really? Yeah. And he's still... He's, wa- how nice wow. he is. Yeah, and he'll, yeah. He'll read your tarot cards. You know? <laughs> yeah, he's into all kinds of physical yeah. things. And I mean, he made, he made a, like this movie, Dust Devil, which I is a really Dust good Devil. movie. That yeah. was a really good film. I yeah. think after off of that, I think he got hired for um, Island of Dr. Moreau, but... It's just fascinating. I mean, this was like a you know a studio film with Brando in it, and and just everything that could possibly go wrong happened. Uh, really worth watching. Cool. A favorite of mine. Uh, it, it's I wouldn't I wouldn't classify it as one of the all time great horror documentaries, but 
essentially now, if you look at a lot of these 80s movies that I cover in my film, there are a lot of great one-off documentaries that really dive into these particular films that mm-hmm. are real favorites of mine. I mean, I love Fright Night. I love Creep Show. I'm yeah. a big fan of Pet Cemetery for a lot of different reasons. Mm-hmm. And they each have their own documentaries. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, you know, Mo- Monster Squad, The mm-hmm. Monster Squad. Monster Squad, yeah, right. Yes. So, so essentially you've got Wolfman's Got Nards, exactly. Wolfman's uh, Got Nards, that's a documentary. <laughs> it's called yeah. Wolfman's Got Nards, which is pretty it's much, a, you know, famous line. Andre Gower, yes, from the movie. Who, yeah. is the, who is the lead kid who says, right. we're the monster squad, yeah. you know? He, right. he grew up, it's a very interesting element of the way that film kind of fell through the cracks. Mm-hmm. Everything related yeah. to the fact that it was PG-13, to the fact that it came uh, a week or two after Lost Boys came out. Right, mm-hmm. right. Because it was sort of, it had some really sort of uh, some elements that were for older yeah. teens, it's, it's but better, it also felt movie like a, Lost Boys. but it also felt like a kiddie movie as well. Yeah. So uh, Andre Andre Gower is in my film, and he, he talks a little bit about that. But he right. really he went de- he did a deep dive with the director Fred Decker, right? And uh, and really sort of investigated everything that could possibly go wrong in marketing a, a really wonderful film. And positioning a wonderful film and why it failed and what right. the virtues are and it's really and it later became kind yeah. of a yeah cult. yeah and they, like didn't a cult they, classic didn't he call it like the first tween horror yeah, film a, yeah exactly yeah, it's like, yeah that's kind of essentially what he felt like it ultimately became. right right but that's a good the, one the other ones I mentioned uh, the one that's about Fright Night is called You're So Cool Brewster <laughs> and uh, that's that's a good deep dive and talking to Tom Holland and Steve Johnson and then the various that's recent folks right that they yeah. just yeah I, I've heard recent. about that one I gotta see that one yeah. and then yeah. um, uh, the one that is uh, about creep show it's called just desserts oh, i don't know this one and, just oh, desserts wow. yeah it's called just desserts that came out just only a couple years ago as well and okay. uh the creep show is just one of my all-time favorites i mean one of the things that when i made uh in search of darkness is i've been getting asked a lot well what's your favorite movie of the 80s and yeah having to pick one is is, is essentially impossible yeah. but one that always creeps into my mind pun intended and non-intended <laughs> is creep show because you've got that anthology feel so it's like you got multiple films in one yeah and it right. really made an impression on me sure. how so, old were you when you saw this film when when I saw creep show yeah Creep Show is eighty two, so I was fourteen. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if Matt's as much of a fan of it as I am. I you mean, know, I, I've gone I back like and forth this, actually because I like the style. I liked the, how they were trying to do something different, and that the bright colors and the yeah. comic book look. And see, I see, I like. See, I read I read a lot of those comics when I was a kid. The, the, right. the, so you the like the ECs, yes. ECs? Oh, comics. me too. Me too. And so Creep Show captured it for me really right. well. So it was very cool just to see. Just for example, in Just Desserts, really kind of the story about uh, uh, they're creeping up on you and and all those cockroaches that they imported. Yeah, that's got to be a great story. From Africa that (laughs) were brought to Pennsylvania that got away. And, and, and And we now have African cockroaches in North America because of Creepshow. Because of Creepshow. <laughs> no. Nice. With no green cards. And I brought one with me right here. He's still oh. here. Oh. Say hi to everybody. Oh. So these these documentaries, by and large, were produced for, I'm guessing, the Blu-ray releases of these movies, right? No, no. This is a feature. This is, is that right? Okay. This, yeah. this is a, a standalone film. It's not, hmm. a, it's not a special feature. Wow. Well, you know what's been great about... We uh, have, uh, all of these that I mentioned, yeah. Oh, cool. We have uh, Amazon Prime, and through Prime... Just recently, it seems like they dumped all these great documentaries, and there's a lot of great rock and roll stuff, but a lot of really good horror things. There's one that I, I watched a little bit of about Hellraiser. Mm-hmm. Really? And so when you're talking about that Hellraiser documentary, you're talking about Leviathan. Uh, Hell- yes, that's Hell- it. Hellraiser that's Hellraiser and Hellbound. Right, yeah. And because Hellbound uh, essentially was a, a very troubled production. Ba- Doug, yeah. Doug Bradley was... was Doug, my friend Doug Bradley was telling me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Tell him to but, come but, to our show. <laughs> the, the, the exchange rate changed, and it, it, it basically dumped their, their production budget, and they decided they were, they were on the fence whether they should continue and even make it. No. The sequel. Yeah. But they went ahead anyway, so he was very disappointed with the production value of the film. Some people would argue that it's a it's a really good film and it and it one ups the original in many ways, just in terms of expanding that universe. But from a production standpoint, the production value he was they go to hell, yeah, yeah. and it's not it, it's it's clearly the, not. But yeah, did he the have effects a few are le- not quite up. Did to he have a few yeah. less pins in his head? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great joke because it's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Those pins are quality ten bucks each. <laughs> but I, I'm sorry, I, I stepped on your. Uh, but one thing I'll say about Hellbound is even with the diminished production value, because it's in hell. It still kind of works. Yeah, I like that because it feels like this fantasy realm. It's very, yeah. it's very MC Escher. Yes, yeah, and, they're exploring the and, world a little more. And yeah. also, to to its credit, you know, maybe Doug Bradley is disappointed. But when I look back at this, I look at it in the same, an even playing field of the types of effects that were being made in, during that time. Mm-hmm. And so I will forgive. Yes, Matt me too. Paintings. I will forgive. Really, yeah. uh, very obvious practical effects. Yeah. You know, any any day instead of CGI, it's right. sure. it's yes. what I want. And the Cenobites in the movie are done really well. Yeah, they I really think. get into more of them. Yeah, they yeah. explore them better. That stuff's always great. I I love both of those movies. Yeah, there's I, a I lot of hell, all, there's a lot of hell, all of Hellraiser them, movies. All of them except that like. last one, like which ten they, of them. Yeah, they made the last one they made that didn't have no. The, that like, was they made it so they could keep the no. That's the, terrible. The ownership. But actually, all of them <laughs> other than that one in their own ways, I like. I they got say, smaller and smaller stories, yeah. but I think they're all very creative. I would agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there were a couple documentaries I saw on Amazon Prime about Night of the Living Dead. Yeah. Mm. And there's two of them that I really enjoyed. Uh, one was called Reflections on the Living Dead. Mm. And there's another one called Birth of the Living Dead. And both those movies kind of cover the same ground when it comes to, you know, telling the story of how this movie went from this, you know, low budget film to this troubled release to finally gaining some critical respect. And now it's a horror yeah. classic, right? But reflections on the living dead, that one has more cast and crew members. It has Romero and John Russo and has interviews with Wes Craven and San Raimi, Toby Hooper, John Landis, and a bunch of others. It's a lot of fun. It's great. And it does give you a nice backdrop of what Romero had to go through to get this thing made, right. to get it released. The the heartbreak of realizing that you didn't have the, the copyright. copyright. I think that's the most interesting yeah. part of that. That's the yeah. most fantastic part of that story. Yeah. For, for, for people who don't know, they, they did not retain the rights because they forgot to put the Amazing. copyright on the on the film. Because it, it had Walter a different Reed, title. The Walter Reed organization. Was that it? Yeah, and then Romero tried to sue them, but eventually the Walter Reed organization went bankrupt. Mm-hmm. And so that was the end of that. Which is which is why they made the remake, the 1990 remake of, of Night of the Living Dead. Right. It was supposed to be, uh, Romero was supposed to direct that. Ah. But then he got so caught up doing uh, the script for The Dark Half oh. that, oh. Uh, that he asked it. Tom Savini to do it. And yeah. that's actually one of my favorite films. I, I, think it's a, I like that movie. I actually. like that I movie. I mean, I, they do a little, things a little bit differently. But I like Patricia Tallman mm-hmm. from uh, Babylon She's Five. Great. She's great. She's in it. great, and I love what they do with the Barbara character and yeah, how they yeah. kind of they, they flip it, it, flip it, which is great. Yeah, and it it's works. great. Yeah, that's now a, that's, that's a really an, uh, uh, kind of under underrated movie. Underrated movie. Yeah, and early to- Tony Todd as well. Tony Todd's yeah, great. That's right. In everything. Yeah, he is. I there's love a, him in everything. Too. Speaking of Romero, there's also a couple of good uh, Dawn of the Dead documentaries. Sure. On uh, that DVD, there was one. Um, it consists of. A lot of footage taken during the filming called Document of the Dead. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is a little bit more vintage and it's fascinating because really it's it's not like you see Romero and John Rubenstein and all these other people older. It's back when they were actually making it. So right, these are right. all the, you know, the actual <clears throat> back in 1978. The other documentary, The Dead Will Walk, is more retrospective. It's got the filmmakers later on and the actors, and it talks a little bit more about the impact right. uh, in hindsight, which most documentaries do. But there, it's a great double feature. Wasn't there one called Fan of the Dead, too? Yeah. 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 That one's, I don't think I, I've seen I that I think one. he goes to all the locations. Yeah, yeah. Visits the Monroeville Mall, and there's stuff on, there's so much stuff on YouTube, too. It's fan-made. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would also add to that, there is a great Day of the Dead featurette that is on the original uh, Anchor Bay DVD. The World's End. And it's called Behind the Scenes with Day of the Dead. Oh, That's the, act- you know, there's another one on the, I, I think on the more recent release called The World's End. Uh, wow. Oh, wow. I wonder if that includes some of that footage because I, I don't know that it one. Must. It but, must. Uh, but yeah, this one is, you know, made at the time and it's, all it is is just behind the scenes interviews and interviewing the 
zombie extras. The, the, and the famous story about the guts that were left yeah, in the yes, refrigerator. Yeah, yeah, it's all, it's you know, great. It, yeah. It's a really, it's about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. But it's pure joy from oh, beginning to end. Okay, and World's End is, is an actual feature. It's available on YouTube about the making of, it's more recently produced. Okay. And- in the Day of the Dead featurette, they also talk about some of the people that they're getting as zombies. And they mention that, yeah, we got this guy from this band called The Cramps. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if this guy wants to bite you, don't let him because he really will. <laughs> nice. Great. Oh, we've had past filmmakers come on our show to talk about films that they like. We had a wonderful filmmaker named Frank Woodward who came on with Frank Dietz to talk about dinosaurs. Well, Frank is a, a very accomplished filmmaker, and he did... There's two documentaries that I he did that you can find on YouTube. One, I love them both. One, I, I knew a lot of the information. That's called Men in Suits. This was from 2012. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and Frank did an amazing job because he was able to talk to all the people who were like monster suit actors, you know? And, and he actually talked to... Doug Jones, who's on our show, oh, yeah. uh, Tom Woodruff, uh, Bob Burns, Bobby Clark, but also Harua Nakajima. Oh, and nice. uh, he talked about being in the Godzilla costume. And then Guillermo del Toro talks a lot uh, about having people in suits and stuff. So Frank did an amazing job on that, men in suits. But the documentary that Frank did that really, I, I didn't know about this until I found out Frank made it, and it's called Lovecraft, Fear of the Unknown. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. And, and the funny thing about it is I know uh, Matt knows a lot about Lovecraft, and I didn't know as much, but I got educated through this documentary. Yeah, that's it's a good cool. documentary. It's terrific because it's got interviews with people who love Lovecraft, like Neil Gaiman and Guillermo del Toro and also Stuart Gordon and John Carpenter. And they really go in depth, and they, they talk about his history and his background. They even talk about the controversies, which is brought up on another show yeah, briefly. Uh, but, awesome. but, 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 but it's like... They explained it. I mean, the guy was had lived a very sheltered life. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And in a way, it's like you could almost understand how his thinking was created in a yeah, way. He, he wasn't a happy guy. No, no, <laughs> no. And his and the way his mother treated him. This yeah, is stuff he, I didn't know. Yeah. It's it's like a, a like a psychology lesson almost. Sure. But yeah. when they start explaining about his writing and stuff. I found it to be fascinating. So those are two, Men in Suits and Lovecraft, Fear of the Unknown. Both you can find on YouTube. Well, we could go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> would, you like, would you like a lightning round? Let's Just do a lightning round. Because there's several I would like to mention. Go for yeah. it, John. Um, several, okay. One is, uh, you know, we're talking about filmmakers and their career and how they touch upon so much great horror and sci-fi. Uh, there's a great feature documentary called Corman's World, Exploits of a Hollywood Rebel. Mm -hmm. And it just covers... Roger Corman's career and they interview all you know so many of the filmmaker young filmmakers who he discovered the actors and actresses there's a great moment in the film they interview Jack Nicholson mm. Jack Nicholson breaks down and cries being so grateful that Corman gave him you know his start mm -hmm. as an actor yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's great it's a really good one there's a good one by uh, Frank Henenlotter who uh, you know made Basket, Basket Case, Case yeah. and uh, Brain Damage on Herschel Gordon Lewis called The Godfather of Gore Ooh. that's mm -hmm. a great one I like the documentaries that kind of cover little areas of the genre that we don't really hear a lot about. This is a great one. I think, Matt, you gave me this one. It's an Australian-produced documentary called Machete Maidens Unleashed. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's oh, great. I don't know that it's one. on the Filipino horror yeah. films of the 70s and 80s. And then they go into the women in prison stuff. Yeah, yeah. But it's a whole it's genre. It's so great. good. Yeah, that's a great um, one. There's a feature-length documentary on the films of William Graffay. William Graffay made The Sting of Death, Stanley, oh Mako my. Jaws of Death, the William Shatner film Impulse. Uh, it's called They Came from the Swamp, the films of William Graffay. Um, I have to also mention our good friend and previous guest, Constantine Nasser, mm -hmm. who has made many, many documentaries yeah, and featurettes yeah. on um, many Blu-rays and DVD releases. He made a great documentary on uh, Val Luton called Shadows in the Dark, yeah. the Val Luton Legacy, which mm -hmm. is on the Val Love Luton that. set. And he's made lots of them, but he's, he's a great documentary filmmaker doing subjects and all the stuff that we love. A lot of Stephen King stuff. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Green, Green Mile. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, you mentioned Jack Nicholson. I think one of my favorites also, just to, as we go around one more time, is uh, the making of The Shining. Uh, Vivian, oh, Vi I love yeah, Vivian oh, Kubrick. In my top 
three maybe Kubrick's of all time. Daughter, he's she's like, come on, honey, here, take a camera. Kind of he's like seventeen years old, yeah. yeah. And you can never see a documentary like and, that now. And she's no. just got access to to Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall. Shelley Duvall the crying sets. about how she's being treated by because Kubrick. Because they they embraced her as as their own, and so she yeah. had complete access oh my and, God, and, so and, great. and the honesty. And and I mean, just I, I think I think that documentary is worth the price of admission alone. Just to it's see fantastic. Jack Nicholson amping himself up with the axe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait, yeah. Right before that scene, and then you see this AD getting out of the way so he doesn't get axed in the head. <laughs> yeah. What's yeah. this documentary called? I want it's, call, it's, call, it's simply called The Making of the Shining. It's on, yeah. it's on the, the Shining yeah. disc. It's on yeah. the disc. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's short. It's, it's a. Like thirty minutes, yeah, right? and it's it's superb, and, yeah, yeah. and it, it's a yep. it's a you know fly on the wall of a movie that has an absolute mystique that uh, people make in you know, a room two three seven about it. Yeah, yeah, I recommend that thing to everyone. Yeah, there's also Spine Tingler, the William Castle story from two thousand seven. That is mm-hmm. a great. Yeah. One. Uh, this was directed by Jeffrey Schwartz, and and this one you can find bits and pieces on YouTube. I think you have to get this on Amazon. Uh-huh. You know, but it's it's terrific because. It talks about William Castle and all his early years working with Joan Crawford and working on Rosemary's Baby and Bug, and it's 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 great. It tells the story like uh, Betty Davis and Joan Crawford working together, and it's a, it's just a great great documentary. <laughs> working together, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, and then the other one, this is a great documentary called "Bringing Godzilla Down to Size" ah, from cool. 2008. Uh-huh. And originally, I remember hearing about this, and the only way you could get it was on a DVD that contained uh, Rodan and uh, War, War of the Gargantuas. Yes, that's right. Yeah, no, that's a great documentary. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it's terrific because it actually interviews, at the time, there had only been three actors who had played Godzilla, and all three of them were interviewed. Hmm. Yeah. And, nice. it's, and it's terrific. But also, they interviewed people... Super Rai wasn't uh, wasn't alive, you know. He, he passed away, but he had a bunch of. There were a bunch of art people, people who worked in the art department and art directors who were all still alive, and some of them still worked there. And they were all interviewed, and they told these great stories about making Godzilla and all these other Godzilla films and some of the tricks of the trade. and And it was it's a wonderful documentary, a tribute to the lost art of suitmation, really. Yeah, totally. Um, I'd like to bust one out. Paradise Regained about the making of Phantom of the Paradise, which oh, was, yeah. I don't know that was one. Yeah. for years only available on a French Blu-ray release. So you had to actually get the import if you wanted this thing. Now it's on the Shout Factory Phantom of the cool. Paradise Blu-ray, which is jam-packed with tons of other features, yeah. including a very long Paul Williams interview by Guillermo del Toro. Nice. Um, speaking of De Palma, uh, there was a documentary called De Palma about four years ago by director Noah Baumbach with Jake Paltrow. And this is De Palma just being interviewed, talking about his films chronologically and his life. And it's it's really fascinating, you know, because when, when he started, he was in the same group as Spielberg, Coppola, Scorsese, and Lucas. And, you know, they all kind of dated the same women, like <laughs> Amy Irving At and Jennifer same time. Salt. Aww. Good times. <laughs> but one of the most fascinating things about it is that he's, he confesses about his troubled family life and that his parents never got along. And that the scene in Dress to Kill where Keith Gordon stalks the killer uh, is actually a parallel on when Brian De Palma followed his father's mistress into his office wow. and stalked her and, and stabbed con- her and not stabbed her, but, <laughs> but confronted him. And I'm, I'm really? watching this and I'm going, Jesus Christ, <laughs> this, wow. is, this is some heavy shit. Yeah. Wow. But, but if you, if you're a De Palma fan, it's, it's required viewing. Huh. It's, it's okay. a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Well, I got a few. Uh, first of all, more brains, a return to the it's living on my dead. List, yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. Bill Philpott directed it and, uh, it's hosted by Brian Peck. Is it? Yeah. yeah. All about Return, Friend of, of, the show. Return yeah. of the Living Dead. And uh, it's great. There's lots of wonderful interviews and behind the scenes stuff. And it's almost as much fun as the original yeah, movie. Yeah. Like it's it's really great. I would also like to recommend Mario Bava, Maestro of the Macabre. Also oh, yeah. 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 Terrific uh, documentary. And a good companion to that is Dario Argento and Eye for Horror. Right. Made by the same people. Great. For yeah. IFC. Yeah. Yep. Both yep. hosted by yeah. Tom Savini. Both wonderful. Check those out. And I love the Alien films. Mm, And if you get the box set, the Blu-ray box set that was called the Anthology box set, Mm -hmm. there's a fifth disc that has all these documentaries on each film. No. And every single one of them is 
great. Really? Now, obviously, the ones I enjoy the most are the films that I enjoy sure, the most. Sure, so, sure, sure. Like the Alien one is beautiful when it talks about the casting yeah. and how Ridley Scott was dealing with the working conditions <laughs> that he was given and trying to get this picture in with the budget that he had yeah. and, and make it look as beautiful as it did. Mm -hmm. right. And then you get into Aliens and it talks about Cameron and his conflicts with the British sure. crew that he had yeah. to work with. Uh, right. yeah, and there was a lot you. of yes. stuff about that of like, you yeah. know, when tea time came, yeah. Yeah. you had yeah. to stop for <laughs> yeah. tea time. Right. Yeah. But it's fantastic. And those documentaries are done with such love. And even the ones that the lesser films, they're the, still the, wonderful. The, the behind the scenes stuff is still great. They're all yeah. great. Yeah. So, so man, I just wanted to ask because I have uh, like the th first three films like separately. Now you're saying though this is it a might... box set because it's not, I don't think it's on those DVDs. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. I bought this Blu-ray anthology set that just has the first four films. Yeah. Okay. okay. And it's an extra disc, right. but it's, right. that disc is packed with mm. Information. I would also like to recommend a documentary, lots of fun, about horror movie hosts called American Scary. Oh, yes. Oh. That's a great one. And it goes through all of the hosts, including Bob Wilkins. A lost and art. Count Gord Duvall and <laughs> yeah. Kyra. Seymour. Zachary, Seymour, Svenguli. It's terrific. It's fun. It moves right along. And I think last but not least, I would like to do a shout out for... Flesh and Blood. Yes. The Hammer Heritage of Horror. Also on my list. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Peter Cushing narrates it, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, directed by Ted Newsom. And it's got, again, wonderful interviews with Kel Welch and Val Guest. Harry Housen's in yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's a lot of fun and uh, really covers the history of Hammer and how they went from being this, you know, fledgling production company to these masters of horror. Yeah. Right, right. Ted Newsom's like a pretty accomplished historian. You know, he's done a lot of stuff and he also did a great documentary called 100 Years of Horror, which kind of covers like everything, all the vampires, werewolves, and Christopher Lee hosted that one. And before we wrap this thing up, I'd also like to do a little tribute to a friend of ours from the Kaiju Cast podcast, mm. Kyle Yount, who did a documentary called Hail to the King, 60 Years of Destruction. <laughs> nice. And he goes to Tokyo and he goes and hangs out with all these people who were in or made or worked on Godzilla films, yeah, including with, uh, Akira, Takarada. Akira Takarada and Shinpei Hayashia. And it's just wonderful. That's awesome. So, David, thank you so much for yeah, making time for us awesome. once again. Absolute pleasure all the time. And we know you have this documentary. Can we see it? How can we see it? Is it going to come out on Blu-ray? If it's not going to come out on Blu-ray, how is it going to come out? How can we give you money? This is not going to be in the <laughs> cloud. You can hold this in your hand. <gasps> oh, yes. Yes. Physical this is media. A tangible with a cover? Item. With a cover? A cover. Unique wow. artwork. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. Anyway, it's, you go to 80shorrordoc.com. 80s. 80shorrordoc.com. It's okay. available only through till Halloween. That's the only time you can get it. You can pre-order it, and then you're going to be able to get it. And uh, you can get the DVD, you can get the Blu-ray, digital copy. It's, it comes with other fun stuff like a you know enamel pin and poster art, and cool. it's very very cool stuff. Enamel and, pin. And uh, yeah, it's going to be shipped uh, the next month, and um, it's very cool. You can get it that way, and that's uh, how you get In Search of Darkness. We're all getting nice. one. I am. And Me then, too. I think I'm going to have to get two because we're going to have to take out of the package and have David <laughs> autograph. Well, you especially auto if there's an enamel pin, right? You oh, keep right. that mint. Oh, how's the enamel pin coming then? Well, it's enamel. <laughs> is it inside the box? Or is it outside the box? How does it come? I guess you'll have to order it to find oh. out. Oh. Curse oh. you, David White. David, the experience of watching this film, it made me wish that you had done the same thing for horror films of the 70s, horror yes. films of the 90s. Yeah, yeah. It, it really is an amazing film. It's and really... to see it with a live audience was yeah. just yeah. terrific. Yeah. That was a real treat. I mean, I've been working on this for the last year. And so I thought I knew what was funny and I thought I knew what was going to hit and I also thought I, well, things weren't that funny and some things really 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 people responded to it, where it just was it warmed the cockles of my heart well, knocked I, it out of the park it, it, yeah. it was really cool just to see people to the point where when you would move around all these posters <laughs> and it would land on the poster that they wanted and the movie they wanted people would cheer yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that yeah. was yeah. super Absolutely. fun so can you divulge whether you're going to be following it up with any other project 
Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm in pre-production right now on a similar yet different project. It's called In Search of Tomorrow. <gasps> and it's 80s sci-fi movie. Yes. Awesome. I'm doing it for you guys. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Oh, I'm so excited. And so, yeah, it's a very similar format, you know, a slightly different approach, but it's essentially the same elements, and uh, you're going to get the people who are in it, the people who loved it, the people who are influenced by it, the people who know a lot about it, and uh, we're going to be starting to shoot that uh, the beginning of next year. Well, well I'm awesome. sure we'll have you back in about a year. Fantastic, yeah. 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 And we're cool. available, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, No pressure. No, no, yeah, I mean, want to talk about, hey, those Monster Party guys uh, what influenced you whatever yeah. well you guys are you guys are the, the absolute target audience as am That's I true. the thing the thing yeah. is when I made this movie in search of darkness I I pretty much made it for myself right that's the you best know? kind of project uh, I mean I just wanted to make something that I thought thought I would want to see mm. and and I think that's the best way to approach anything I sure. mean, there are all sorts of elements that come into play in terms of who's available how much money and time you have I mean right. all the re the reality elements but at the end of the day you come up with a project and you're like was this something that I would be proud of is right. this something that I would say I want to take my evening and sit down and watch this right. is that something I'm motivated to do and so that was very much a, a sort of a, a foundational approach as to why I made In Search of Darkness. And I plan to do the same with In Search of Tomorrow because it's the stuff I love. Right. Well, David, thank you so much for making this film. And I can't wait for the next documentary to come out. <laughs> yeah, so really? let's raise let's, our glasses. Hey, a hey. toast to David Weiner. Woo! Darkness. Woo! In darkness. Time for a listener shout out. Shout out. Ooh, I like your shout out, Sean. <laughs> shout out. <laughs> that was good too. This shout goes out to Robert Adams from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Robert Ooh. Adams. Robert is now the proud owner of a Monster Party t shirt. He yeah. is it. Robert, thank you so much for thank your support. You. We hope you enjoy the t shirt. Wear it proudly, Wear sir. Yes. Skin tight. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Monster Party merch is still available on our eBay store, which is Monster Party Store. Easy to remember. And yeah. you don't have to get it skin tight. You know, you can no, get it a little loose. We loop. prefer it that way. <laughs> yeah. Sean would like that. Yes. And we have two new reviews. Dun, dun, hey, dun, dun, dun. No. A gift from the gods. Oh. <laughs> Is not this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on. Come on. We don't know what this guy says. Uh, this is from Van Tiki. Van oh, Tiki. Hey. Years ago, I followed my childhood dreams and went to Hollywood to make rubber monsters. Cool. Now, you may think that the best part of working in a creature shop is making monsters, but it isn't. The true wonder of the job was discovering kindred spirits who would talk for hours about the subtlest details of monster <laughs> lore and FX artistry. To this day, I sorely miss debating the finer points of Godzilla's foes, but no more. <laughs> my old FX buddies pointed me in the direction of this podcast, and now my studio is filled with deep talk about Ultraman, <laughs> gorilla suits, and the inner workings of the Nautilus. Hey! Hey, nice. Thank you for warming this former makeup FX artist's foam rubber heart. Oh, oh that's nice. lovely. Awesome. Thank you, Van Tiki. Yeah. Van Tiki. Hope nice. someday we get to meet you at Monster yeah, Palooza. Definitely, something. yes. Yeah, please. stop by and say hello. Yes. And this comes from Baltimore Andy. Baltimore, Baltimore Andy. Andy. Definitely in my top three. Nice. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, what? No, no, no. Hey, there's a lot of podcasts out there. I'm fine to be That's in the top right. three. There's hundreds of Who hundreds are of you? Who are you? No, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Baltimore Andy writes, all you ever wanted or needed to know about horror, sci-fi, and fantasy across all forms of media is discussed Ooh. in this frenetic and fun podcast ghoulishly hosted by a hilarious <laughs> band of psyched out cinephiles. <laughs> <laughs> their, their, cinephiles. Their childlike giddiness. Oh, wait, wait. <laughs> particularly well, that, infantile. Par wait. Particularly that of the indelible Larry Strothe <laughs> <laughs> is as infectious as a zombie bite and their <laughs> deep knowledge of obscure horror gems will help listeners impress their friends on movie night. Well, there you oh. go. Another fan, Larry. Yeah. Nice. Feel better about yourself? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Thanks. That's Thanks. Great. Thanks, buddy. All right, Larry. I think you have something you'd like to share. <laughs> well, I think I uh did we mention this? No. no. 
<laughs> That's why we're doing it now. <laughs> so, so for listeners, if you want to check out a great article in the fall 2019 issue of Retro Fan, it's it's Retro Fan number six magazine cool. that you can get on the on the. The newsstand. The the newsstand. From the paper boy. (laughs) (laughs) There's a great article by Rob Semtek. Yeah. Who, uh, he did this article on alien toys. Cool. And uh, he had listened to our show and and heard that, you know, we're very knowledgeable. And he reached out to us. And we, you know, we knew, or at least I knew a lot about the alien toys and had the alien toys. So he did this little interview with me. And I mean, it's not all about me, but it's it's it's. But in your head, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great article because he interviews several other people who all remember that great Kenner alien toy that came out oh, in yeah. 1979. Yeah, it's a beaut. And uh, and the other alien uh, items and and in the magazine, there's a great little photo of me and and uh, and also there's a picture of my alien toy and my alien egg. Which yeah. had an alien puzzle inside. Cool. With the Monster Party logo in the background. Right. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. So, hey, it would uh, mean a lot to us if you check out this great magazine, Retro Fan. Do it. The fall 2019 issue. It's issue number six. It has Sven Gulli on the cover. And the cool thing about this is, you know, I got it just because, you know, okay, it's all about me. But, but there's, <laughs> there's other great articles in there. I, there's a wow. great uh, the interview with Butch Patrick. The original Ghostbusters TV show, cool. Bob Burns as as Tracy the Forrest Gorilla, Tucker, Larry Storch. yeah, and also a whole thing about Sven Gulli, and there's a big article on James Bond. It's a great issue. It's, awesome. a, it's a great magazine, and yeah, really well put together, and worth seeking out because it might not be that easy to find at uh, your local newsstand. Yeah. I think that you have really, really turned a corner because the fact that you are in something and then you're also promoting the other things in that magazine. <laughs> well, right. see, here's the fun. No, see, is mind-boggling. Does it really mind Is it mind-boggling? Yeah, Cause, yes. Because I have to tell you, of course, the first thing I went to was the alien article. Right. You sure. know, but, and, but and, I, and, and then... The I, fact that you don't feel <clears throat> like those other articles are a threat. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, no, 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 because <clears throat> look, look, I'm, 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 no, 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 I'm not the James Bond expert. James here's the expert. Sure. Oh. But I, I started to read the James Bond article. I'm like, oh my God, this is great. James has got to see this. And then I looked at the Butch Patrick one. I'm out, and, this thing, yeah. and I went, these, these are It's a good magazine. The magazine is like a labor of love. Of all the it stuff is. That he it is. And, and it's like, you just don't, you know, we've seen magazines come and go, you know, oh, and, yeah. and this, it was so great to see this article and then to see this magazine. Magazine and the, it's it's color pages and it's just, I love it yeah I really love, love it friend. and I want to give a, a special shout out and a thank you to Rob thank you so much for interviewing me and writing such a great article on the creation of the alien toy he actually interviewed some of the the, the people who created the alien toy from Is that Kenner right? really so cool. that's that's what so it's not just hey here's Larry's memories he he really did some in depth. Uh, research and talk to the people who created it. So cool. great article, Rob. I'll check it out. Nice. Awesome. I also have a shout out I'd like to do for um, Sean Hates. Sean Hates is a, a director. He just directed, uh, I believe, his first feature film called Big Top Evil. Big oh, Top okay. Evil. And this Sean had actually kind of invited um, Monster Party actually to like a screening of the film, which we were, we were not able to do. So he actually sent us a, a screener, a Blu-ray screener of the film. Um, I've seen it. I think I've, get, I've given it to you I'm, now. I'm Matt next to watch next. Next in line. But yeah, I mean this. I mean this movie. Like he obviously this movie was made in a, a tiny budget, but it's very. It's done very much in the kind of the grimy grindhouse kind of Rob Zombie style. Perfect. You know, and it's basically it's you know this group of young travelers who um, are like lured to this carnival run by like these evil cannibalistic clowns <laughs> it's, it's really twisted and gory and violent so it's like if it was a good film <laughs> oh i'm kidding i'm I, I enjoy that it. Is a i'm, co- I'm kidding but I mean, this movie like i said this movie is, you can tell it's done very in a very small budget but it's done with with real passion and real love for this stuff you know i can tell that sean's a big rob zombie fan you know it's that kind of style uh, in fact, Bill Moseley uh, has a part in the no. movie. Is that right? Yeah, really? yeah. Wow, yeah. He's, and he is like kind of like the leader of the. They, they like these clowns capture <laughs> people to force them to use in their sideshows. Oh my! Or, you know, or they eat them. It's like it's Matt. That sounds like very it's right twisted. up your alley. It, yeah. it is. Yeah, it's very it does. twisted. But uh, I'm, I'm interested. Yeah, but Sean, thanks a lot for seeing us this. It's, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, like I said, I think this is his first film, and it's a uh, it's a real labor of love. And uh, good job. And uh, yeah, we look forward to uh, more clown mayhem <laughs> from you. But thanks a lot. Yeah. 
And I would like to give a shout out to one of my favorite children. Mm. And that is Sig Takoda. Yeah. Son of Matt Takoda. And uh, they are like two of my favorite people, but a really wonderful father and son cosplay team. Yeah, you met them at G-Fest, yeah. yeah, didn't you? We, yeah, and we they, all went them, yeah. Yeah, and they make these costumes that are always great. Amazing and, costumes. Uh, just perfect. Just like they walked out of a kaiju film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just mm-hmm. wonderful. And uh, anyway, so it was Sig's birthday, and he loves Kiss, as do I. <laughs> and so I had some Kiss items that were donated to us by the Jason Lindsay collection. <laughs> cool. And I sent him some kiss figures and a couple other things. And he sent me a nice thank you letter. But what he also sent me was this incredible picture that he drew of Kenny Peller from Stan Against Evil. Oh. No. <laughs> and it is amazing. We will take a picture of it oh and my we will God. put it up on the site. Oh, that is but great. It is great. This kid is awesome. This kid really is. I mean, talk about uh, a monster kid just cut from the same cloth as us. Yeah, totally. yeah. But uh, Sig, we love you, yeah. and we can't wait to see these guys again. No, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's so funny. You bring up a kid. I brought something that I wanted to share with you guys. Sure. And this means a lot to me. Okay. Now, if you guys recall, I've talked about... You know, toys, you know, we talked about toys that we had when we were kids. Do you guys remember there was a toy that I had as a kid that I loved and adored, and I cherished this thing. Okay. And I played with this thing till it literally fell apart. Okay. And this was, I was about like five or six. I remember getting this toy in Santa Cruz back in like 1969, 1970, around that time. And I always wanted to try to find this toy. What was it? What was it? It was this giant rubber pterodactyl. Oh, yeah, you've mentioned this yeah, before. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, as we know, to find something that's made of rubber from that time yeah, period, sure. it's like virtually impossible. And there are certain ones like we're kind of like it, but not exactly. Yeah, that's right. right. You guys say, like, is it this territory? No, it's not. Is it yeah. this territory? No, it's not. And and I, I looked for years and years and I told people about this pterodactyl, tried to describe it. And everyone would show me these other pictures, like, no, no, guys, that's not it. That's not it. Guys, I have something to share with you. <laughs> Go. Oh. Oh my God! Here we go. I've got this not too long ago, and I just wanted to share it with you. It is a oh, he's pulling out I a hold j- in my hand a jar of melted oh. rubber. Here it is. Oh, look that at that pterodactyl! Oh my God! That I had now the thing about this pterodactyl, this rubber pterodactyl right here that I'm holding in my hands. This is the toy that I had. Wow! When I was five years old. Now, the thing I loved about this, it, it does have a little damage. It has a, a torn wing. Okay. But if you guys look at the color. Oh, it's yeah. a beautiful Look at the shape. color. Yeah. I mean, and it used to have a yellow uh, a string, bungee string, yeah. which is right, gone. Right. But the little metal thing is here. It could still, I could still hang it up if sure. I wanted to. Yeah. But guys, just look at the green color. It's great. The green and yellow color. That's I still, I can't believe the color of this pterodactyl is still there. So, I know where, how did you get this? I had uh, become friends with some people who are uh, Jiggler fans. That's what they're called, like okay. Jigglers. Right. Rubber Jiggler toys. Rubber Jiggler toys. Right. And I had let it be known that I was looking for this. And someone pointed out that there was someone who may have one of these. And they decided to put it up on eBay. Now, I, I have to tell you guys, I, I was willing to pay just about anything for this. But because his wing has a little tear in it, it's not meant. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I was willing to pay a lot of money, but no one else bid on it, and I got it for such a deal. Wow. And to have this pterodactyl now in my hands, it's like, you know what? I'm done. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm done. Wow. I don't think I need to collect anything else. Is there a way, wow. is there a way you know, that you can kind of mend the, the rubber with I the guess tape with the wing? I, I could try to maybe. Like how to, would you do I, I think there's, there's like glue, but some people say, you know what, Larry, don't do Just anything. Just leave it alone. Yeah. Just true, leave it true. alone because what am I going to do? Am I going to make him fly? Like yeah, yeah, I made yeah. him fly. Guys, I remember playing with him out in the backyard yeah, saying yeah. I was King Kong and this was a pterodactyl <laughs> coming to attack me. Right, right. And he flew all over the place and all over the backyard and I would f- throw well, him sure. in the air and stuff. Because you were a kid and Having fun with your toy. Yeah, before I changed, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I realized what the hell am I doing? And you've changed again. You're you're out of collecting. 
be- like I don't even know who you are anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this thing is a thing of beauty. I really yeah, do. I think really it's cool. and and the one that you got here. I yeah. mean, yeah, there's a little tear. Yeah, but it's in overall Great really shape. nice I mean, look shape. At it, look at it, this kind of see through a little. Yeah, bit. yeah that's yeah, right, really Sean. Cool. I always love he was kind of, the yeah. light shines through him, yeah. but the green and it's the great. yellow blend of paint. Yeah, they really so you're gonna put him in a like a little case or something. Yeah, yeah. Put him in a case. But guys, you mentioned this is from like 1969, 1970. Yeah, and for a little condition. rubber toy, I mean, actually, he's big. He's he's yeah, like he's like a, he's over a foot long from wingtip to wingtip. Yeah. But I just wanted to share this with you guys because you guys are my friends, it's cool. and we I had talked it. about love this. It. And this really means a lot to hey. me. It's it, it may not be the most priceless, no, but it, you know, but piece to but you. It's it I, is, it I is love priceless. It. I Can I share something with you? Yeah. Because there's a jiggler that I'm looking for, mm-hmm. which is it's the Ben Cooper King Kong. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Well, there's there's a few of them. There's, there's it's it was a gorilla. Was that, it the one arm up. It, or something? One arm is up. Yeah, yeah. and it uh, the the hair. Some of the, there's been copies. People have sort of copied that design. Yeah, where the hair is kind of molded a little bit more uh-huh. out and obtrusive. Yeah, mm-hmm. but uh, the one that I had, it was just a little bit textured. Right. And I had this, and I remember I made a movie with a friend <gasps> of mine, a Super 8 movie. And set it on fire. I don't, I know, <laughs> no. For once, no. But we made this film called King Kong versus the Martian Monster. <laughs> and we did it in this living room, and, you know, we had paper buildings. Was it stop motion or just like? No, uh, just jig- we just oh, jiggled okay. them around. Okay. And the Martian monster was Colossus Rex. Oh, no, yeah. cool. from the, the from outer space, space, space basement. Nice. Yeah. yeah, and so we had them knocking into paper buildings, and I oh. had this gorilla. And then the gorilla, what happened? Because I played with it a lot. Right. The arm that was down. Mm-hmm. Started to have a split yes. in the armpit, yes. Yes. and yes. eventually just came off. Yeah, right. Yeah, and uh, so that was done. And I've been looking for one like that, and and it's it's tough because I yeah. I'm trying to remember even what I had. Yeah, right, and I'm right. pretty sure it's this Ben Cooper one. Right. But here's the thing: Do you still have the film? I, you know, I don't because the kid has it. Oh, oh right, and, right. and I haven't seen that guy in years. Right, so, right. I don't, but oh, do but I have a pretty. Yeah, oh. I, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> His name is Kevin King, and uh, Kevin King. Or if you're out there <laughs> listening, send, send that film. Uh, sure, but uh, but I I think I'm pretty sure I rem- I know what it is. I can show you something. And even I, if we got close to okay, it, it'd be. Yeah, I yeah. can yeah. show you uh, thinking thinking back to the year that this w- would have been. I have some. Examples. Maybe okay, I can show you. Sure. You can tell me if yeah. that, that's it. But that'd be see, great. So yeah. we're yeah. The, the, we're the, simpatico. The r- rubber figures. Yeah. Go, go ahead, guys. So I cool. want you to touch it. What, 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 what <laughs> were the Matt, other? Touch it. What touch were the it. other? Okay. What, what were the nice. other feels jiggers good. in the series? Like, what were, the, were there other monsters? Yeah. Like, were there, there a lot? There were dinosaurs. Oh, okay. And cool. that's and the funny thing is I've been seeing them around. The the, the pterodactyl meant the most to me because number one, hey, this was in King Kong kind of a thing. Right. Right. Uh, and also the color, and this is the one I the had. Eye, the mm-hmm. eyes are great. The, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's great. There was a. I believe there was a Tyrannosaurus Rex, a Brontosaurus. I think there was a Triceratops. Mm, cool, okay. And then the, the sailback one. This is the only yeah. one that really kind of makes sense. To me, right. Yeah, well, right. It, totally. Right. Yeah, totally. Right. Totally. Flies, you bounce yeah. it up and down. And it yeah. had, it had sure, a string yeah. that you could... And, and, mm-hmm. yeah. and guys, the, again, the hours of enjoyment from the silly little rubber creature. Sure. And, yeah. and I remember yeah. it was a dollar, guys. This was back in 69. Sure, yeah. That was a lot of money. Yeah. I can't believe my parents paid a dollar for it and it was in Santa Cruz we went to the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk and do you remember that? Oh okay, sure okay. yeah and there are these little cheap little dime stores yeah, across yeah. the street uh-huh. that's where I saw it. I went oh <laughs> I don't know <laughs> right? I, yeah. I don't hear kid have a doll I, I don't know I, yeah. but and <laughs> I love this thing I love this it's great, it's it's great. So thank here, you for sharing it's that back yeah, in my mind. yeah. Cool. I love it and let's remind our listeners, you can find us on Facebook at Monster Party TV. YouTube is also Monster Party TV. Our Twitter handle, at Monster Party HQ. Instagram is also Monster Party HQ. And uh, please take a moment and write a review on whatever platform you're listening to us on, because chances are very good we will read it on the air. Yeah. Yeah. On that note, I am Matt Weinhold. I'm Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Stroth. And I'm James Gonis. Keep America strong! Make your own horror documentary. The one we're making is all nude.
No, I shouldn't. Be it works selfish. for you. Don't don't change it. No, I'm not. I'm I'm learning not to be selfish. But but I do have something to share with you later. Ooh, that is kind of selfish. <laughs> okay, but, but 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 it's deserve deservedly selfish. I mean, I deserve to be selfish. You you know what? You deserve to be selfish whenever you choose. You deserve a break today. <laughs> so hey, I don't I don't get know. away to Donald's. Monster Party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting sued. Uh, see, that's why I don't think we should we should do that. <laughs> no, tall, nobody yeah. cares. Sausage nobody cares. Wait, two two all beef patty special sauce. Let's see, pickles, pickles, onions, 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 bun. I remember that. Hey, you know what we were talking about? Uh, my wife and I were just going back and forth about like little kid songs that we did mm-hmm. that were like funny or dirty kid songs that you oh, learn as a kid. Yes, and I re- and one came up that like I like pulled this out of my memory. But it was, do you guys know the Batman song? Of course. Yeah. Batman smells, Batman smells. Well, this is a different one. Okay. Oh, okay, let me hear it. Batman took it to the movies. Batman played with the boobies. Batman <laughs> took it to my house. Batman put her on the couch. Batman put it in easy, pull it out greasy. Batman. <laughs> oh my God. My, my mother I've was never, surprised. No, there's never, more. There's oh, more. more. My mother was surprised to see my tummy rise. My father was disgusted to see my tummy busted. Batman. <laughs> <laughs> You remember the Adams Family one? No, what's that one? The Adams Family started when Uncle, Uncle Fester, Fester farted. Oh, they really were not retarded. retarded. The Adams Family. <laughs> the house is made of shit, and so is Cousin <laughs> It. Morticia sucks her tit. <laughs> the Adams Family. <laughs> Okay. Okay. You know when we're, we have we're Lisa, not we're not doing this. We yes, we are. Loring we just did. Wait, isn't this the topic, topic of today's show? <laughs> yeah, dirty kid songs. Dirty kid songs genre. All right, related but unrelated, and I just want to say that uh, I've uh, my I'm starting to show all these vintage commercials to my son, and he is a huge fan of the early Hawaiian Punch. Oh, oh those yeah. were funny because you Hawaiian have this punch. guy walking up to someone and say, "Hey, how'd you like a nice Hawaiian Punch?" The guy goes, "Sure." And just clocks the guy, and, yeah. that, and then that's it. Yeah, that's the whole. Yeah, they're selling. That's right. He asked for fruit it, juice yeah. because the guy clocks him, and it was a white guy it's punching a, a black guy. Which is even worse. Oh. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> what? Wait, was no, it? he's he's no, Hawaiian. No, he's Isn't he Hawaiian? Hawaiian. That's the you, it does, the joke doesn't work unless he's Hawaiian. No, because he, 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 he has like a straw hat. Wait, where right. did he has you like get a, that? He's like a native guy. The guy he punches is not. Hawaiian. He's white. He's a tourist. Yeah, he's a tourist. And he's he has walked a tourist into the wrong hat. part of town. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's right. like, hey, cousin. Hey, howdy. Hey, how'd you like? <laughs> <laughs> All right, shall we start this? And then yes. Sean goes, ooh, teeny, ooh, teeny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that still uh, makes me laugh. Still funny. It still, still makes funny. me laugh. It's the way you do it. Time for listener shout out. Shout out. Shout out. Shout- hey, wait a minute. Can, can we all be involved in this? <laughs> well, I usually come in at the end, but okay. Because, well, because I well, thought- no, because he he wasn't. You weren't saying anything. No, because sometimes I thought I, I was like dominating, so I I stopped. I stopped what doing is, it. What is with you tonight? <laughs> God, well, like- I want I want us to be equal. You're not, you're not dominating. <laughs> no. When do you you think you're dominating? Yeah. No, what I did, I started to do this. Show, and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna like lay low. It's on fine. The it's it's you good. Know, it's very stressful. Laying low? What are you doing? <laughs> <It's festive. laughs> this the is not the time for you to <laughs> lay low. Okay. <laughs> when we say shout out, you're allowed to be happy about well, that. The other thing is, I want to make sure people heard that we were saying shout out, and I thought we were oh, like, oh you whatever. Know, okay. okay. All right. Oh, let's try it. Okay. We'll, we'll say shout out okay. and then be okay. 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 You you, I'm gonna you try add your dramatic pause. Okay. I'm gonna try and time it with you. Okay. Here we go. Jesus. Christ. Yeah, okay. Fuck. It's like dealing with Joan Crawford. <laughs> <laughs> Time for a listener shout out. Shout, shout out! out. Shout out. Shout out. That might be a little too. <laughs> yeah, just volume wise. See? Uh, you see? Uh, well, don't uh, scream into the mic. I was me. I was, I was trying to, I was too enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah, you need to bring what him f- down. Okay. Sean, what the fuck? Okay, here we go. Come on. Come on. Get your head in the game. Okay. <sighs> All right, here we go. I just had to, a little parched. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> nice Foley. 